TikTok, time to rock. Good evening, good morning, good afternoon to everyone who's watching from all around the world. As you can see, we are four hours earlier than we normally go live, and that is by so many requests from European viewers who say, come on, it's the middle of the night here when you guys go live. Why can't, why can't you do something that we can watch live? We can only watch it the next day. So rather than people trying to stay up in the middle of the night, we decided to do one at a time that works for European viewers. We'll see, uh, we'll see how, many of, uh, how many of our European viewers actually show up. Wait, who said no sound? Come on, I don't believe that. I see sound right up here. Yeah, who said no sound? Yeah, I, 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 some people say no sound, and I n I never know if no, uh, it's, if it's a troll, if it's a troll. Guys, just confirm that we have sound. Yeah, you did. I just heard you. Yeah, I put up the line. Oh yeah, yeah Paul. Oh yeah, Paul Trigg said slow mode, please. I forgot to enable. They, they they I don't know if you know this, Sam, but uh they uh they made the slow mode massively more they made everything more difficult with the new studio you don't know that because you don't know how to use anything on youtube yeah i just do the live thing except man. go That's live but um yeah so they had they had uh for years basically forever they've had what's now called classic which is no longer available but everything was nice and simple you go to a page and then you have three tabs and within those three tabs you can uh, you can adjust anything on your video any setting uh, you can change everything. You can uh, you, you can change you know title all that stuff, and, and then you click on another tab, and then you can adjust all the other stuff, and and so uh, so nice and handy. And then they made they they made the the new studio, the new YouTube studio, and I've spent a good portion of my adult life trying to figure out the new studio. It's like they're saying, hey, let's make it as as complicated as possible. And so right now. I've had to figure this out three or four separate times on how to how to uh, enable slow mode on this new version because it's so confusing <laughs> that, I, that I have to find I have to figure it out over and over again. All right, if I recall, I go to this. Bear with me, ladies and gentlemen. I totally uh, totally forgot that because man. All right, and I believe I go up here to live stream settings. Oh, there we go. Ha, ah, yes. Okay, that's the first time I've actually kind of remembered how to do it. All right. And save. That should that should have enabled slow mode. Oh, yeah, it does. Slow it mode did? is on. Ha! Ah, a message every ah, 60 seconds. Learning this new super complicated YouTube studio like a boss. <laughs> All right. I, don't, I, I sometimes wonder, like, what the heck are they doing? Like, why would you... I mean... The tendency with everything is to try and make things easier, more simple, less complicated. And with this, it's just YouTube just... I, I, I wonder if they're trying to weed people out and only get like, you know, people who really understand technology on YouTube to try and weed, you know, weed weed other people uh -oh. out. That from, means I'm gone, buddy. Videos. Yeah, you're, I'm done. you're done, dude, because you can't figure Show anything history. out. Yeah. Yeah, they're not going to... They're not going to... Oh. I mean, dude... You're a, you're what a, a what a shot, man! Jake, nineteen ninety nine. Thanks for the encouragement. More likes than I get views on my live session, huh, Jake? <laughs> hater, man. <laughs> what a hater! <laughs> yeah. All right, uh, all right, everyone. Well, uh, I'm. We're about to go through. Uh, we're about to go through a video. Uh, just one. How many of you are actually from Europe and are tuning in? And matter of fact, how many of you? Is anyone here who is tuning in now because it's uh, because we're we're going live at uh, at an earlier time? Who wouldn't normally watch us live? We're just trying to figure out if this actually uh, if this actually uh, helps. Um, but uh, if it does, maybe we'll maybe we'll try a couple times a couple times a month to go live at an earlier time, just so people in different parts of the world can check us out. Uh, Lolo Mimi okay. says uh, hello from the UK. That's right. We, that's why we're doing it for the UK audience. Yeah. Razzles, I see you're back again, Razzles. Why don't you just give out my full name again, my social security, my address, and my children's <laughs> social security, Razzles. Razzles is an Assyrian. He's uh, he's uh, Zina's brother. Zina's a solid Assyrian warrior princess for Jesus. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah, actually, ahead, no, actually, uh, actually, uh, yeah, there are, uh, there are a lot of um, people. Uh, we got Sweden. 
Last names, uh, Sweden. Paul Trigg says England. Um, off key, off key says UK. Uh, Jordy says UK. Uh, Sal Al Noom says Europe here. Uh, that's right. Sal Noom is a good brother. Michael says I am. So that's uh, that's Europe somewhere. Uh, Sony Thomas says me. Tommy says I am. Um, bunch of people are typing one, which I think means yes, they're from Europe. Uh, Bojan right. Marja. Um, UK, yep, yep, a lot of them, yeah, they are. Charles Law, I'm, UK, from, UK. I'm from Poland. Uh, Hyper wow. Picker from yes. UK. <laughs> Europe, <laughs> someone said Europe, someone said Austria. You got a lot of people from Europe, man. Kami, Kami says, time. Kami says the police state UK here. <laughs> Eurasia, yes. Uh, Robert says Netherlands. Uh, Kazakhstan, <laughs> the greatest country in the world. Hey, do you, you know, I'm laughing. You ever see what? So we're, because we're talking, uh, Razzles, uh, he loves the Lord Jesus Christ, but uh, they started a debate on my channel with a guy named Andrew Martin over the flat earth. He's a flat earther. And I said, don't start these debates on my channel, dude. I don't care if you believe the yeah. earth is a rectangle. Yeah. A rectangle. That's irrelevant to the topic of salvation. Yeah, my son, my son Luke goes around saying that it's a, it's a dodecahedron, um, just to show how, how, how dumb it is to start this uh, start this debate. But uh, yeah, no, dude, dude. I mean, it's it's not just that topic. It's uh, kind of any topic where people become obsessed with this topic and start the the side debates on on irrelevant topics to to the topic we're discussing. I normally I normally you know give them a warning and they just start blocking because. Uh, uh, That's what some people are some people some people become obsessed with uh, very strange issues and doesn't matter what the topic is you could say ah man matter of fact <laughs> one of the issues one of the issues that I have with with Seventh Day Adventists like I don't res I don't regard them as a cult because they have orthodox yeah. understandings of the core doctrines um, it, it's my, my objection is you guys are obsessed with one thing that the 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 New Testament authors clearly were not obsessed with. And uh, yeah. I, it's to such an extent that one day I was posting, I posted on Facebook that this was, I believe this was the day when uh, Paley's nurse had adjusted the settings on his monitor and we didn't hear the alarm go off when he died. Wow. And then my wife gave him CPR and I posted something about it. I posted, hey, you know, my son... Uh, here's the situation with my son. He actually uh, died. My wife brought him back with CPR. I, I posted all this, and this guy actually posts, "Yes, but David, why don't you honor the true Sabbath?" And I was like, "Are you freaking kidding me, dude?" <laughs> right? Yeah. And so, uh, so yeah. Right. So anyway, in the ch in the chat in the chat, there can always be people who uh, have these uh, have these you know side interests and so on. But guys, you know, I don't. I don't I don't come to other, you know, I don't come to people's live streams and then say, oh, this is the topic. Let me talk about this completely different topic and try to sidetrack everyone. Um, so, yeah, but, uh, yep, still yeah. still going down the line. UK, Europe, London, France. Yeah, you got a lot Germany. of people from Europe. Yeah, yeah this time, is. Then. Yeah, we might. This is a good time. Yeah, we might need to, uh, we might need to uh, try going live a couple times a month for uh, other for people. Yep, London, London, and London. Just remind them why you did this. He was doing Lottering. it for the people in UK because Adnan Rashid is from the UK. So you wanted to get more people from UK listening to use this against Adnan Rashid, who is in the UK. So I guess it worked. Glory to Jesus Christ. May the Lord Jesus bless this session and purify us in his blood. Lord Jesus, cleanse us of our filth. Fill us with the spirit to glorify you in Jesus' name and save us from error. Yep. May Christ be glorified. And I just want to yep. say something, what you just said. You said something interesting. I, too, uh, believe that there are true believers, born-again believers, in every major Trinitarian branch of Christianity, and that includes Seventh-day Adventists. One of my favorite speakers is a Seventh-day Adventist minister who's quite knowledgeable. His name is Doug Batchelor of Amazing Facts. He's a Jewish follower of Jesus, and he's SDA pastor, and I consider him to be a knowledgeable Christian who is a brother in Christ. So I also want to say I'm... Same boat with you. I'm, you know, same page. Dude, we got we got people all over the place, dude. We got people all over the place. Uh, <laughs> From all over the planet, Mina, or you done about believers? All over the place. Mina Carlos says, uh, dude, say Egypt. Egypt. See? Good time. Yeah. You're getting no, people no, in the East. Egypt, Finland, strange things, uh, says Israel. Ali Ja says Morocco. It's a good time, David. Uh, still got to get close to 1,000. Sri right? Lanka. Still. Multiple people from India. Multiple people from Africa. We've got Kenya. We've got Ghana. So, yep. All right. Well, Scandinavia. 
All right. All right. Well, anyway, uh, South okay. Africa. Yeah, bunch of people from Africa. All right. All right, dude. Well, we'll have to we'll have to try this a couple more times. All right, ladies and gentlemen. Now, now here's what's funny. <laughs> here's what's funny. Uh, someone, a couple people yesterday post, sent me a link. Said a nun posted a new video. I have not watched this video. Yeah. I have not yeah. seen one second of this video. I downloaded it. I downloaded the video, and I set it up uh, here in my program to watch it. Now, Sam, you've you've either watched all of it yeah. or you've watched some of it. What do you yeah. Yeah, because you sent it to me last night, and I thought it was really urgent because you rarely send me a link to anything. So just... when you sent it to me, I went into panic mode and say, oh, this must be something important. So then I tortured myself to listen to the entire, oh, really? what, 15 minutes? Yeah, yeah. I listened to it. Well, I mean, I, I was freaked I was, out when you sent it to me. You know, I was I'm like, what? what happened? I was getting requests, but I was trying to edit that monster 30-minute video that I, I finished recording last night. It took me all night to edit, so I knew I wasn't going to be uh, I wasn't going to be watching any uh, ad non videos and stuff. But uh, people wanted a response, so I was happy to was happy to watch it. But uh, yeah, that's a so send it to you, and uh, you could check it out now, Sam. Before we actually so anyway, ladies and gentlemen. I'm actually watching this blind. I'm going to be seeing it for the first time, yeah. as 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 the rest of you are. Uh, Sam, uh, Sam can give us the uh, the the, the yes. gist of the argument. But Sam, are you uh, notice 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 how confident we are? Yeah. <laughs> I'm sitting here taking a video I've never seen. A Muslim, he's making arguments, I guess, for Islam and against against our position. And uh, I'm happy to go ahead and, and play it. Maybe maybe we should start doing that sometimes, just taking videos and uh, watching them live with people, and then uh, and then dissecting them. But Sam, were yes. you impressed with Anand's video? Hang on, I don't even remember what it was called. It was called something like "Does the d does the does the does the Quran know the Bible?" Or did the did the author of the yeah, Quran I, know I the I Bible? Forgot the, yeah, yeah, I okay. even forgot the title of it. To be honest with you, it, it, to be honest, uh, it is obvious to me. You know, and I know I get attacked for being very direct in my feelings towards these apologists because I can't stand when someone who claims to be representing God, and God is supposed to be a God of truth, uses such tactics and dishonest and deceitful arguments because it's not a game. Let me just put in perspective. We are battling for our souls. If you believe God exists and Adnan believes God exists, and you believe there's an afterlife in which we will either enter God's presence and enjoy his love and peace forever, or be cut off from God <clears throat> eternally. It's not a joke. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is not a game. We're not. We're not here to win arguments. It's people's lives at stake. Their everlasting uh, destiny is at stake. So when he produces a video of that quality in order to dole meat to his audience, because he's obviously now trying to appease the Muslims, he realizes those who think critically, think logically, think honestly. Those who truly want to think consistently, he's not arguing for them anymore. It is quite clear from this video, he's doling meat to his Muslim audience in order to inoculate them from the damage that your videos are causing upon the Muslim minds by the power of the Holy Spirit for the glory of Jesus Christ. It was so pathetic, I really got upset watching it. I really got upset watching it. But again, Jesus did say that the devil is a murderer and a liar. And when he lies, that is second nature to him because mm -hmm. that's that's his nature. He's evil. He's wicked. He is deceitful. He's conniving. All the characteristics that the Quran attributes to Allah fits Satan perfectly. So it is not surprising that those who are under his influence, those who are being influenced by him and blinded by him, would adopt his tactics. Deceit, being conniving, trickery, lying and even murdering, and you find that in Islam, don't you? Jihad and, and Allah's being the greatest deceiver of them all. So we see why Adnan has no shame in lying mm -hmm. about what his own sources teach and has no shame in misleading and deceiving people because until the Holy Spirit sets him free, until the Lord Jesus, by the power of his Spirit, by his grace, sets him free, he cannot help but imitate the God that he serves, and unfortunately the God that he serves is not God, but Satan under <clears throat> a facade, you know, disguise. So mm -hmm. that's what it is. Yeah, and Sam, uh, what, one thing I've noticed about the, uh, the Muslim YouTubers is it, it's, it's one thing, right? It's one thing when a, when a Muslim in the chat says, 
you know, Surah 2, verse 79, proves conclusively that the, the Quran affirms the corruption of, of, the, script, of the Christian scriptures and so on. It's they mentioned one, that again. Yeah. It's one thing when a Muslim in the chat uh, says it, because I know these guys don't read their sources. I know they don't know. They, 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 don't, they, don't, they haven't read the commentaries. They haven't read the verse in context. They probably never read the verse at all. They've never read it. They've never read Surah 2. Um, they don't know how many times Surah 2 affirms the scriptures uh, that are, are being talked about in, 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 in that chapter and how chapter 2, verse 79, there's no way it could possibly be referring to the corruption of the text. Uh, they don't know any of that. So when they say Surah 2, verse 79 refutes you, I know that they're they're not trying to be deceptive. They're not trying to lie to me. They just don't know what they're talking about, right? When yeah. the uh, when the apologists who have read the Quran, who have studied it, who have read the first in context, who have read the commentaries, who know who know what the rest of the Quran says, when they do it, I just can't help. I can't. I mean, I can't help thinking that that they know what they're doing. They know they're misleading their oh. audience about what the Quran says. And I've noticed this pattern. Um, that we see with Adnan in his, in his first video response to me, right? When they start setting up the issue, the, 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 what they do is they, uh, they start with this condescending look, like, like it's a joke, right? Because they know that a, 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 most of their viewers aren't actually able to follow the arguments and, and think, through this, think through this critically. They're more, they understand that their audience is watching for, how confident are you? So they immediately start showing, oh, I'm so confident that this is a joke. And guys, it's not, it's not a joke. I mean, at the, uh, towards the end of my video that I posted, uh, by the way, did you guys see the video I posted um, earlier today? It was pretty awesome. Uh, you guys should check it out. But the, I, I closed out with, uh, with a quotation from uh, Abdullah Saeed, uh, who's, a, who's a Muslim professor at the University uh, of Melbourne in Arab and Islamic studies. And he, he posted a massive journal article on how the Quran actually shows massive respect for our scriptures and that Muslims should have that same respect because our scriptures are the same as they were in the time of Muhammad when Muhammad and the Quran were showing nothing but respect towards our scriptures. And so you've got, it, it's not, you can't say this is just us, right? I mean, that's Muhammad thought we had the scriptures. The Quran really sounds like it thinks we have the scriptures. Lots of Muslim commentators, especially in the, in the early centuries, Yes. believe that we had reliable scriptures and so when you just act like <laughs> it's so it's so stupid of these christians to pretend that we have a problem here dudes you got a problem you got a problem that your quran affirms scriptures that completely contradict your quran and so i, I pointed out in the, the video i posted this morning i said when you have the quran and it affirms the inspiration of our scriptures but the quran contradicts our scriptures on fundamental doctrines you got two possibilities here either either our scriptures have been corrupted, and so, yeah, inspired originally, but later corrupted, and that's why they no longer line up with our scriptures. Uh, or two, the author of the Quran had no clue what he's talking about. He's ignorant. Uh, they obviously don't want to go with that, so they have to say corrupted, but what if we then go on to show that actually you, the Quran doesn't say that our scriptures have been corrupted. In fact, the Quran says just the opposite. It affirms, it affirms not only the inspiration, but also the preservation and the authority of our scriptures. Your religion just self-destructed. That is something that is something that Muslims, if they have any concern for truth or reality, should be sitting down saying, wow, we have a major issue that could uh, undermine our entire religion. And if this argument is correct, if we do, if our religion actually does, affirm the inspiration, preservation, and authority of the Christian scriptures, game over. Uh, so we need to take this seriously. And instead, yeah. and instead, they start completely massacring the meaning of various Quran verses, like 279, and pretending that this answers this. And when they're doing that, I can't help, I can't help but think, you know, you, you, Mus you the Muslim who actually studies this stuff, again, the, the average Muslim, I don't think he's trying to be deceptive. I think he believes it. And I think, you know, he hears this because they trust their leaders saying, oh, yeah, 279, that answers it. But the Muslims who actually read this stuff, it's like they have to know, yes, there is a massive problem here. Yes, if this problem ever becomes common knowledge, it will destroy our religion. And therefore, I have to mislead Muslims into thinking that it's not a problem. And... So they're just misleading. What, anyway, what yeah. do you think about that? And then we'll get into the video. Yeah, well, that's the thing. And ironically, everything you just said, you're going to see that Adnan is basically 
again trying desperately to show the Quran does say the Bible is corrupt because he doesn't want to admit that Muhammad is ignorant. That's actually the focus of his video. You're going to oh, see. Oh, willing. It. Oh, awesome, awesome, awesome. I thought yeah, it, I thought it was just. I thought it. I thought his video was just a. Uh, uh, he, he's trying to prove that Muhammad, Muhammad, was re inspired by Allah because he corrects things in the Bible. <laughs> That's what it's basic. So he's trying to show that the Quran is not from Muhammad. It's from Allah, and Allah made known things about the Bible to Muhammad that shows it has to be divine in origin, that the Quran says things about the Bible that later textual criticism proves to be true. How did Muhammad know that? See, because it's revelation from Allah. So he's again trying desperately to show the Quran does say the Bible's corrupt and that the Quran does not confirm the preservation authority of our scriptures and that the Quran is a miracle because Muhammad is correcting the beliefs of Christians, beliefs based on uh, <clears throat> dubious passages, and he's going to bring up First John 5, 7. There are three that bear record in heaven. How did Muhammad know that? He was not a textual critic, and Muhammad didn't read the Bible. See, that tells you Allah revealed the Quran, and the Quran is revealing these corruptions to the text that now modern textual criticism is affirming. That's basically the gist of his point. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And we'll see how well that goes for him. Um, yeah, uh, terrible. Uh, terrible. Uh, and by the way, let me let people know, I, I already came up with a three-part response to the video that goes with this session. It's on answeringislamblog.wordpress.com. Answeringislamblog.wordpress.com. You're going to see part 2B, and in each part links you to the previous one. So if you want to follow along, go to the blog and go to part 1, because the first part is going to have, have to do with the Torah and the Pentateuch and how the Quran corrects the Pentateuch as proof that the Quran does not confirm what we have today. So follow along and use the materials for the glory of Jesus Christ to expose his sham apologetics. I just want people to know that go there. Michelle says, uh, I saw it. It's nonsense. I assume you're referring to uh, Adnan's video and not to my awesome yeah. epic video that I posted this morning because no yeah. one no one could refer to my video as nonsense. Uh, yes. Exactly. Uh, T. Chuyen says, I became a, Patreon, a patron of both of you. Sent message through you. it. Yeah. Uh, Thank yeah, you. God guys. Bless you. Yeah, uh, everyone so around much. everyone around the world who's watching, um, we know it's coronavirus. So if you so uh, guess what? Yeah. So even though you're earlier, you still got over a thousand. See, yeah. glory to Jesus Christ. May the Lord Jesus be glorified in the power of the Holy Spirit, as He purifies us in the blood of the Lamb. The blood of the Lamb. The Lord Jesus cleanses us. We love you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, before I was uh, before uh, Sam rudely cut me off, <laughs> right. I was going to say, guys, coronavirus. We don't know how long this is going to last. So. Uh, uh, so don't 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 worry about supporting the supporting me. My work is online, so I actually a lot of people are going to be out of work for for coronavirus. Yeah. Uh, I do everything online, so I'm actually going to be in a in a lot better position than most people. So don't worry about supporting me during coronavirus. If you did want to support someone, uh, Sam Shamoon is right there. And the reason I say that is. We're always making plans for the future, and once uh, once Sam is fully covered to be online all the time, uh, we're we're actually gonna make sure we we live in the same area and put oh, together please. a studio and be going live every yeah. single night, every day, three hundred sixty five days a year. I, I want to just say something to some uh, because we talked about Seventh Day Adventists, and a guy said, Doctor Dre said, yeah, but Doug, Douglas Bachelor believes that Jesus is the Archangel Michael. I don't want to get into that, but let me real quickly point out, I said this in some previous streams, the Seventh-day Adventists <clears throat> who are Trinitarian don't believe Michael is a creature. Doug ba Douglas Bach Bachelor, I have his book right now, he defends the Trinity from the scriptures because to them, Michael is not a creature. Michael is the name of Jesus, who is the eternal son, the second person of the Godhead. So yes, you may not agree with that, but they don't believe Michael is a creature because Jesus is God Almighty. He is uncreated, eternal. You can do Doug Bachelor the Trinity as a session demonstrating that Jesus is God Almighty without beginning, without end, even though one of his names is Michael. I just want to clarify that. They're not Arians like Joe's Witnesses who believe that Jesus is Michael and therefore a spirit creature. He does not believe that. Mm -hmm. just want to be, be clear. We're not endorsing Arians who are anti-Trinitarians here. All right. Well, um, well, cool. We have uh, over 1,100 people watching now. So, uh, yep, maybe we will start going live uh, a couple times a month for people in other parts of the world. All right, Sam, you ready to start this video? 
by the grace of Jesus Christ, trusting the Holy Spirit to fill us. So let's ask the Holy Spirit to show up and bless us, anoint us, speak truth without error, to destroy the lives of Islam for the glory of Jesus Christ. Have your way, Holy Spirit. We need you. We depend on you. We love you. In Jesus' name. Amen. And, uh, let's do it. And uh, guys, uh, once again, I have not seen one second of this video. I sent the link to Sam, but I have not yeah. watched it. I am watching it blind. That's how confident I am. That there is just nothing in these videos that is uh, going to uh, do what a nun thinks that it's going to do. All right, Sam. So uh, you'll want to uh, listen. Sam's going to be listening on kind of a delay to what we're listening. Um, but yep, let's go ahead and start watching this. I'll cut it off at some point, and uh, then we'll see what happens. All right, here we go. So David Wood and Co claimed that the author of the Quran, whoever that is, we believe that's God, uh, but they claim that he did not know what was in the Bible. I will prove to you that the author of the Quran knew what was in the Bible well. God Almighty knew what the Christians and the Jews had done with the scripture, with the gospel of Jesus Christ, and with the Torah of Moses. We will tell you how we know that. Now, I'll give you one example. Amazingly, the Quran mentions similar stories that are found in the Bible, but it does not repeat the mistakes. Now, it is impossible for Muhammad, peace be upon him, to be an archaeologist, to be a historian, to be a linguist par excellence in order to know all these stories that, are, that have only come to light in the 19th century. I'll give you one quick example how I know the author of the Quran knew what was in the Bible and he knew the errors, the mistakes of the Bible, which were not put down in the Quran, the story of Joseph in chapter two. All right, I just want to pause it right there after one minute, uh, because now I have an idea of what he's going to do. Um, so apparently, apparently, Adnan is arguing that Muhammad, or the author of the Quran, knew the stories of the Bible and is correcting them. And I'm guessing, I'm guessing, I'm guessing that uh, by correcting them, it's going to be anytime I find a difference between what the Bible says and what the Quran says, Absolutely. then the Quran is somehow correcting uh, the the scriptures and not, it's not that, that he just didn't know the stories very well because he's only hearing them from other people yeah. and can't read them. It's, uh, it's that he's actually correcting them. And yeah, he mentions and the story of Joseph. So that's what we're about to go yes. into. Go ahead. Uh, no, I was going to say, and don't forget what his point is, though, that modern archaeological discoveries confirms Muhammad's version of those stories happens to be correct, not the biblical version. Awesome. That's what he's trying. So you understand his point, right? Archaeology confirms mm -hmm. that Muhammad's narration of the story is the correct narration, the correct version, as opposed to the Bible that's full of errors. Mm -hmm. How did Muhammad know that? That's his point. <laughs> okay, so we have, so the idea oh. here, ladies and gentlemen, is going to be, the Bible gives a story. The Quran modifies the story, but then modern research confirms the Islamic version of the story, and therefore this is more evidence for Islam. Is that about right, Sam? Yes, you got it. All right, so we're ready to go on. So this first example yeah. is the example of Joseph. I'm assuming he's talking about he's talking about Genesis yeah. Joseph and not uh, not, Joseph, jo not yeah. Joseph and Mary. Yeah. Okay. No, no, Joseph, yes. Okay, That's all right. Okay. All right, ladies and gentlemen, you all know where we're going. Here we go. It makes a distinction between the king of Egypt in the time of Joseph, which was the old kingdom, and the king of Egypt at the time of Moses. Amazingly, the Quranic text makes a distinction between the two kings when it comes to their titles. Amazingly, shockingly, surprisingly. And I will give you the details very quickly right now. And this is to prove that the author of the Quran knew exactly what was in the Bible and what was inaccurate historically. And this was an inaccuracy in the text of the Bible. The king at the time of Joseph, which was the old kingdom, nearly 19th century BC or the 20th century BC, whenever Joseph li uh, lived, whatever um, chronology you may choose to follow, but that was definitely the old kingdom. At that time, the title Pharaoh was not used for the kings of Egypt. 
This much is very, very clear historically. And Egyptologists who deciphered the Egyptian language, the hieroglyphs, they have made it very clear that there was a family called the Hyksos. They were governing Egypt at the time. Hyksos kings were not known as pharaohs. They were simply called Humph, H-M-F, which literally means your majesty. Or this is how they were referred to. It All right, I'm going to pause it right there so that everyone understands what the argument is. Uh, Sam, so Anan is claiming, uh, he hasn't gone into a lot of detail yet because I paused it, but Anan is claiming that uh, the Bible is actually getting some names wrong and the Quran is actually going to properly draw the distinction between the proper titles and so on, and that we're going to find out from modern archaeology that the Quran's yeah. version is right. So what? What's uh, you? You? You've, you've yeah. encountered this argument many yes. times before in the past. Go ahead and break it down for us. Yeah, this this argument, this canard about the title Pharaoh not being in use at the time of Joseph, and therefore the Bible is incorrect when it has the narration or has Joseph in the narr narrative referring to the king of Egypt as Pharaoh. This has been an argument that Answering Islam website has addressed ages ago. If you go to the AnsweringIslam.net website, this was actually a claim made by Islamic Awareness. Now, Islamic Awareness website, there's actually one of the speaker corner, corners, uh, Dai, one of the Muslims there. His name slips my mind right now. He's one of the writers, and he's a friend of Anand Rashid. But even back then, we already corrected this claim and demonstrated that this argument, David, assumes that Moses, for instance, the Exodus took place around the 1300 BC as opposed to 1400 BC. Because again, what Adnan just did, folks, I, got, I want you to understand what he just did. If he's saying it's an er error for the Bible writers to use a later term for the king of Egypt, <clears throat> And that the Quran avoids that mistake because when it narrates the story of Joseph in chapter 12, Surat al Yunus, there the king of Egypt is never said to be the Pharaoh, but he's simply called the king of Egypt. He still ends up condemning the Quran. Here's why. Many scholars, if not most, I won't say most, but many scholars, specifically conservative scholars, believe that the Exodus took place around 15 in the 15th century BC, 1400s BC, because of the internal evidence as well as the external evidence. And I highly recommend, and I hope you guys watch the series called Patterns of Evidence, where you have this Christian going around examining the data and the evidence supporting the Exodus as an historical event. And he quotes scholars showing that the evidence strongly posits the Exodus in the 15th century BC, 1400s. Now, why is that important? Because if you date the Exodus of Moses in the 15th century BC and not later, you have the Quran quoting Moses, speaking to Pharaoh, and addressing him as Pharaoh, even though according to Adnan, the Pharaoh at that time would not have been called Pharaoh. And here's why. According to the archaeologist, the title Pharaoh was first used in the reign of Amin Hophus the fourth. Now I'm, again, I'm butchering the Egyptian names. I have a hard time speaking English. But Amin Hafiz the fourth. If you can pronounce it better, go ahead. Now Amin Hafiz the fourth is around 1352, 1338 BC. That's the first time the word Pharaoh was used for the king of Egypt. But if Moses and the Exodus took place in the 15th century BC, that means at that time the king of Egypt wasn't called Pharaoh. But guess what? In the Quran. Moses calls Pharaoh, Pharaoh. Here, chapter 7, verse 104. Moses said, O Pharaoh, this is chapter 7, verse 104. O Pharaoh, lo, I'm a messenger from the Lord of the worlds. So, David, you see what Adnan just did? Mm -hmm. He assumes a particular mm -hmm. dating for the Exodus in order to make the Quran fit with his argument, but ignores the massive amount of historical, archaeological, textual data that posits the Exodus in the 15th century BC, a time in which, according to him, the Pharaoh wasn't called the Pharaoh, but the Quran has Moses calling him the Pharaoh at the wrong period of history. So now, David, I'm not too logical, but wouldn't that mean 
he just condemned Muhammad for making a mistake, anachronism? Uh, yeah, if, uh, if what you're saying is correct. So just to, just to review here, what you're saying is um, very common to date the Exodus to the 15th century B.C., but if you go with that date, the common date for the Exodus, then the Quran would actually be wrong according to Adnan's own argument because uh, pharaohs weren't called pharaoh until later and according to his argument and therefore that what he has to do is assume a much later date for the Exodus and he just has to assume this. I'm assuming, Precise. Sam, that he's going to go and defend it and show that the Exodus was actually uh, was actually later than is is commonly yes. thought. Is he going to is he going to prove that the Exodus is later? Yes, uh, that's what, they're not in the video, but that's what he has to assume. Yep. That's why I noticed he was careful though. Did you understand what he said? He goes, "It doesn't matter the chronology." Did you remember he started that way, right? Because he's arguing for the time of Joseph. So even if you go with a later date for Joseph, still. That would be within the range in which Pharaoh was called the king of Egypt. But it won't work for Moses. You see the point? He has to argue for a later date of the Exodus. And by the way, most scholars that date the Exodus to, let's say, the 1300s BC is because of references in Exodus, Exodus 111 to Ramesses. Now, this is something that we need to elaborate for the benefit of Christians so they understand how the Bible is composed, how it is inspired. We do not believe that inspiration means that you cannot have a later inspired editor, meaning a prophet, updating earlier books, earlier material with place names that would be relevant to a later generation. In other words, just because in Exodus 111 you have a reference to Ramesses and Ramesses was not the Pharaoh at the time of Moses if you go with the 15th century <clears throat> BC dating. Why then a reference to Ramesses? Because we believe that inspired prophets would update earlier material and change archaic names to modern names so they could be relevant to their audience and the audiences would know what locations <clears throat> these refer to. So there is nothing that goes against believing the Bible is inspired and holding the view that, let's say, Joshua writes Moses' obituary, and a prophet after Joshua writes Joshua's obituary, and then someone later, who's inspired by God, updates archaic names. And we do it all the time. For example, David, if I say to you, President Trump in the 1980s was accused of sleeping around with many women. But hold on, he wasn't called the president in the 80s. Am I making a mistake? Uh, no, th this sounds like uh, it's, 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 it sounds you know similar to if you're talking about place names and stuff uh, where a place will have a name, but then centuries later, the name will change. And so if you refer to it by the original name, no one knows what you're talking about. And so you would you would you would update the name. And then if someone critic wanted to come along later and say, aha, well, look at that. The they're using a name that wasn't even around at that time. Well, yeah, because someone updated the name so that you, so that so that modern readers would know what the heck it's what the heck it's talking about. And that's why most people think the Exodus took place in 1300s BC because of the reference to Ramesses. However, if you go with the internal evidence, statements in Judges and Kings, which give you the time frame from the time of Exodus and when the Israelites entered the land of Canaan, you'll see that the dating of Judges, and it's all in my article, by the way. If you go to part one, I have all this information there that you can go and peruse and study and use, and you're apologetic for the glory of Christ. The internal evidence actually posits the Exodus 15th century BC. So if the internal evidence pushes it to 15th century BC, why then do you have some scholars, and mostly skeptical scholars? There are some conservatives who would hold to the 1300s. But it's mostly skeptical scholars because of the reference to Ramesses, which is later. But if you take into consideration that someone later on could refer to a place that at that time of Moses wasn't called Ramesses, but when the Israelites settled into Canaan and when an inspired author came to update the earlier material, that place was now known as Ramesses. For him to change it to Ramesses doesn't mean the event took place at that time, but that he's updating the name of that place to what was known at the time when this inspired author or editor made some changes to the earlier material, and that doesn't undermine inspiration. 
And by the way, the series of documentaries that I'm talking about, you can get them on Amazon. It's called Patterns of Evidence. This Christian interviews the scholars, and he says, if you go with the 15th century B.C. dating, the evidence for the Exodus and the ex existence of Joseph is massive, and he documents it. But if you go with the later dating, there's, <clears throat> there's hardly any solid evidence that an Exodus took place. This is why you have skeptical scholars who date the Exodus to 1300 saying, yeah, it's myth, fiction, it's myth, it never took place, because when you date it at that time, there is no evidence for it. But if you go with the 15th century BC dating, the evidence of history, archeology span is overwhelming. And don't take my word for it, folks. Go and watch the series called Patterns of Evidence, and he interviews top-notch Egyptologists and archeologists working in Israel. So it's not some, simply my opinion, it is simply a fact of the evidence. You place it in 15th century BC, massive amount of evidence for Joseph's existence and the Exodus. Later date, hardly any evidence to support it, which is why you have skeptical scholars saying it did not happen. All right, uh, well, we're around th 1,300 viewers right now, so that is cool. Um, so Sam, let me see if I got you uh, correct here. Um, we have a good amount of evidence for the Exodus taking place in the 15th century, but if yes. that is true, then the Quran is wrong, according to Adnan's reasoning, for yes. referring to Pharaoh, because he didn't have that, that, that wasn't the title for the rulers here. We wouldn't have a problem with that, right? We wouldn't have a problem with someone for the sake of, of clarity, referring to someone as, as Pharaoh, because that's what people knew the, the rulers of Egypt as. Um, but according to Adnan's reasoning, this is a massive problem and would refute the Quran. In other words, if the, according to Adnan's reasoning, if the Exodus actually took place in the 15th century, where you have the most evidence for the Exodus, according to Adnan's reasoning, the Quran is wrong and false and should be thrown out and would need yes. to be updated by a later prophet who can fix the mess. Yeah, in fact, let me repeat the point. According to what Adnan is referring to, he didn't give you the information. He, I, mean, I saw he quoted something, but he didn't read out loud. The title Pharaoh was first used of, and again, I'm going to butcher his name. Wait, do you, I mean, do you, want, to, do you want to go? Do you want to go back to that quotation, or are you reading? Yeah, something see else? what he says. There. No, I'm actually, I'm not reading his. It's okay. in my. This, all this information I've compiled for the benefit of your viewers. It's on Answering Islam blog. Amin Hafez the Fourth. I know I'm butchering his name. This was the first time that the title Pharaoh was used. It was used of Amin Hafez the Fourth, but he he was king of Egypt around 1352 to 1338 BC. That means prior to that, Pharaoh wasn't used. But if the Exodus took place in the 15th century BC, 1450 to be exact, and the Quran here in several places, just one to to again remind the audience, just one of many, chapter seven verse 104, Moses said, "O Pharaoh." Pharaoh, lo, I'm a messenger from the Lord of the Worlds. So here the Quran has Moses referring to Pharaoh by a title that, according to Nan, is wrong. Because if the Exodus takes place at 1450 BC, you know, 15th century BC, and the evidence seems to overwhelmingly support that, then he just condemned the Quran for committing a serious anachronistic error, anachronism. Mm -hmm. See, this is what happens when you fight tooth and nail to avoid the obvious teaching of your book, that your prophet confirmed the scriptures in the possession of the Jews and Christian time Muhammad, and those are the scriptures where they have Joseph referring to the king of Egypt as Pharaoh and as king, and yet Muhammad had no problem with it, but that none does, but in having a problem with it, he condemns Muhammad as a fraud and the Quran as a fraud. Mm -hmm. He wants his cake and eat it too, and he's not going to have it. Yep. Uh, shout out to Vladimir, who joined the Boom Squad. Uh, Sam, we got a funny comment here from King Rich. King Rich says, uh, Mary is the sister of Moses and Aaron. <laughs> but that's just that's just funny. If the uh, if the Quran, if the Quran were really uh, correcting the Bible and we were going to uh, look to modern research to solve these mysteries, then we know, according to the Quran, um, we know, according to the Quran, that Mary, the mother of Jesus, was the sister of Aaron and Moses. If, 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 if for, you, yeah. for those of you who are new to this problem, uh, I have an entire video on there, and Sam's got articles, but I have a video titled uh, Quran Error, 
was uh, Mary, the mother of Jesus, also the sister of Aaron and Moses, something like that. You can you can search for it. I made that like probably 10 years ago. But the uh, the idea here is the idea here is that the Quran affirms. Uh, let me put it this way. Uh, the Arabic names for Miriam, the sister of Aaron yes. and Moses, is the same as Mary, the mother of Jesus in Arabic. And the author of the Quran thinks that they're the same person, even though they lived 14 centuries apart, right? So people would address Mary, the mother of Jesus, as sister of Aaron and daughter of Imran, even though that that's that's what... Yeah. Yeah, that's where... <laughs> that's Amram, yeah. right? So... Uh, so, yep. so, ma so notice, Sam. If we if we wanted to take a nun's argument seriously, we'd have to say, okay, according to the Bible, there are two completely different uh, Miriams who live 14 centuries apart, and they're two completely different people. The Quran, the author of the Quran, thinks they're the same person because they have the same name. Um, therefore. What is modern scholarship going to show? Is modern scholarship scholarship going to confirm that the author of the Quran was correcting our mistaken view that yeah, if, if exactly. two if if two people lived fourteen centuries apart, they're obviously not the same person? Um, yeah. So, and to add a final point to why Adnan's argument is problematic, notice he's what he's trying to argue. It's only until recent archaeological discoveries that we now know. Muhammad corrected the Torah. But folks, don't forget what we've been saying like a broken record. And we're going to go over the verses over and over again, even in this session, if the Lord Jesus wills. How many times do we need to repeat what the Quran says that one of the proofs, guys pay attention, one of the proofs of Muhammad's prophethood is that he confirms the mm -hmm. scriptures that the Jews and Christians possess at that time. Yeah. And I can go through the verses, but real quickly, just to give them to you, chapter 2 of the Quran, verses 40 to 44, chapter 2, verses 40 to 44, chapter 2, verse 89, chapter 2, verse 91, chapter 2, verse 97, chapter 2, verse 101, chapter 2, verse 121, chapter 2, verse 136, chapter 3, verses 3 and 4, and then you go to chapter 4, verse 47, chapter 5, verses 40, 43, 48. Do I need to go on? No. It's all covered in this video. Now, what's the point? If Muhammad is saying, proof of my prophethood is that my book and I confirm your scriptures. Your scriptures are the authoritative, uncorrupt revelations of God. And then don't forget that David and I brought up the hadith in Abu Dawud, Sunan Abu Dawud. When the Jews came to Muhammad, and wanted him to judge a matter. Muhammad was sitting on a pillow. Muhammad says, bring me your copy of the Torah. Now don't forget, their Torah would contain the story of Joseph, where Joseph in Genesis calls the Pharaoh king of Egypt and Pharaoh king of Egypt. He takes the Torah, removes the pillow, puts the Torah on the pillow, and he looks at it and he goes, I believe in you and him who revealed you, not a word of its textual corruption. Now, this was proof that Muhammad is a prophet because he confirms their scriptures. Now, if Adnan is saying, if Adnan is saying that it wasn't until recently that we discovered that this was an error in the Quran and Muhammad was correcting that error, how in the world would the Jews at that time know it's an error? Because what Adnan just did, he just put a weapon in the hands of the Jews at Muhammad's time to condemn him as a false prophet because they would have said, hey, Muhammad, you're lying. You're not confirming our scripture. Do you know why? Because our scripture, Joseph calls the king of Egypt Pharaoh. How come you don't call, call the king of Egypt Pharaoh in your narration of the story of Joseph? Remember, if it was only until <clears throat> modern times, and I think he said 19th century, I don't remember, that we discovered that Pharaoh wasn't in use at the time of Joseph, then how would the Jews at Muhammad's time know that this was simply a correction to an error in their Torah when Muhammad is saying, I confirm the Torah, and if he contradicted the Torah, that would be a weapon in their hands to say, you're a liar because you don't agree with our scripture, you're a fraud, therefore we have nothing to do with you. In other words, his argument ends up putting a weapon in the hands of the Jews to expose Muhammad as a fraud for contradicting the scripture they had that he said he confirmed. You see the problem? 
Yeah, I, I don't think people understand how much of a problem this is, especially Muslims, right? Because, I mean, you pointed out all the verses in, in, Surah, in Surah 2 alone, and that's important because that that's where they go to show that the Torah is supposedly That's where corrupted. he's going to go. Yeah. yeah, that's where he's going to go. The Quran repeatedly, repeatedly, repeatedly over and over again like a beating drum says jews you shouldn't be rejecting this new revelation because it's a confirmation of what you have with you not it's a confirmation of what you originally had but has now been corrupted it's a confirmation of what you have with you why would you be rejecting mine when i'm affirming yours why would you be rejecting my revelation when i'm affirming your revelation and if if the Quran was somehow attacking that revelation, that whole the whole reasoning falls apart. It makes no sense. Uh, uh, also, you know, it, you pointed out you have all these uh, all, all these passages in uh, two uh, two forty to two forty four and uh, two ninety one and so on. Uh, but you also have Surah two verse eighty five, where Allah asks the Jews. Uh, are, do you just believe in parts of it and not all of it? He condemns them for taking certain parts of the of the Torah and only believing those and not believing the entire thing. None of this makes any sense. None of this makes any sense if the Quran is condemning our scriptures as corrupt and is is coming to correct them. So Anand's just his entire position is completely absurd and ludicrous to anyone who just reads what the Quran says. The, the, in other words, the message of the Quran is Jews, I'm affirming your scriptures. Jews, I'm affirming your scriptures. I'm not just affirming the inspiration. I'm affirming the scriptures that you have in your hands. The scriptures that you have in that Torah. You have a physical copy, just like Muhammad takes the copy and says, I believe in you and in the one who revealed you. Just like Allah says, Jews, you don't need Muhammad because you have the Torah. Just like we have that throughout the Quran, that's what I'm saying to you. Your scriptures are as good as gold. And then Adnan comes along and what the author of the Quran is really trying to do is say that your scriptures have been corrupt and I'm here to correct them. It's so utterly ridiculous yeah. to anyone who's read the sources. I can't, I mean, I don't, I try to give yeah. people, I try to give people yeah. the benefit of the doubt and thinking, okay, maybe they're just mistaken here. But when you have a mountain of evidence and Adnan knows about it, he's read the sources. He knows, he knows what his scriptures are saying. I, I don't know what to do, man. This is bad. Yeah. This is bad, dude. And David, don't forget they would not know he's correcting their Torah until modern archaeological discoveries, right? Mm -hmm. So then what were all these Jews to do throughout those centuries if Muhammad was correcting their revelation, yeah. as opposed to assuming they're, he's contradicting our revelation and therefore he's disqualified from being a prophet? How does that work? Yeah. All right. Well, uh, let's go ahead and, uh, and check out a little more. Um, comment. Uh, got a comment on, uh, I just got a message from, well, I don't want to give his name. Um, but he said, I belong to a Muslim family. And after watching your videos, I realize I should convert to Christianity, Amen. but I need a miracle or a dream so I can find the truth, so Amen. I can join Christianity, and I also am afraid of my family. I'm so confused. I don't know what to do. So it sounds like he's actually in a position like Nabil was in, but in kind of a, a more severe form. And yeah. th this, just, this just popped up. I glanced at it, and I saw, uh, saw that, and... Uh, uh, but basically it's a similar position to Nabil where he's realizing, wait a minute, I got some problems in Islam and the evidence points to Christianity, but it's going to cost me so much that I don't want to just jump into this. And so God, could you please give me a sign? Could you yes. please give me dreams? And so it, it, he looks like he's in a, in a, uh, he might be in a worse position than Nabil because Nabil at the end of the day knew his family, you know, is not going to hurt him or something like that. He just knew they're going to end up arguing a lot. Uh, but you know, other people in, in different areas, uh, will, it's much worse if they, it's, it's much more costly to leave Islam and embrace Christ. So uh, I, can get, I guess I can give his first name. His name is Hamza. Uh, so everyone, please pray for Hamza. Amen. In Jesus' please name. Please pray for Hamza. Please, please. That's what we're here for. We want Muslims to get saved, and they're getting saved because Jesus is alive. Jesus is risen. He is the Lord of glory, and by his spirit, he's bringing people to himself. We love you, Lord Jesus, and have mercy on us and keep us in love with you. Bless Hamza, Lord, for your glory in Jesus' name. All right. You're pumping me up today, man. All right, let's go. Uh, got around 13.50, and I don't know why I kept Adnan up on the screen this entire time. I'll have to take him down next time. All right. Well, we're, nice picture, too. We're going to watch. Yeah. It's funny because <laughs> when they when they make videos about us, they'll take like a, a picture like where we're in mid-word, where we're like this, right? Yeah. <laughs> I didn't try to do that. I just, that's where it, that's where it stopped. But uh, all right. So, yeah, next time I'll, I'll try to remember to take Adnan down in more ways than one here. All right, here we go. Yeah. No, was in the time of Moses, later on, somewhere around 14th century BC, 
or 15th century BC when the title Pharaoh was used for kings. Now when we go to the text of the Bible in the book of Genesis, the king of Egypt is called Pharaoh in the time of Abraham. The king of Egypt is called Pharaoh in the time of Joseph. The king of Egypt is called Pharaoh in the time of Moses. Amazingly, the Quran does not repeat this historical error. The Quran, referring to the king of Egypt in chapter 12, Surah Yusuf, calls him the king, simply the king, Malik. The title Malik for the king is there in chapter 12 of the Quran when the story of Joseph is being told. But when we come to Moses in the Quran, the king suddenly turns into Pharaoh. His title is Pharaoh, the Pharaoh. Now, this is a subtle point in the Quran, but it is an accurate one. The author of the Quran clearly knew that this was an error in the Bible. And only God could know that at that time because this fact, this very fact, came to light in the 19th century. It was only in the 19th century when hieroglyphs were deciphered or decoded uh, satisfactorily and the scholars could read what was written in the temples and they came to realize that the title Pharaoh was not used during the old kingdom for the kings. So this is an example as to how we know that the author of the Quran knew well what was in the text of the Bible and this is why he criticized the corruption of the Bible in chapter 2 verse 79. <laughs> in chapter 2 in chapter 2 verse 79 of the Quran. Oh, hang on, yeah. Uh, Sam, you could go ahead and finish listening to that clip because everyone, uh, Sam's probably on a 30 second delay. So when I play a clip, he's hearing it about 30. He's not hearing it through Skype. Yeah. He's hearing it through the live stream and it's about a 30 yeah. second delay from when I'm seeing it. So uh, Sam yeah. will be a little bit behind me. All right. Let me get uh, us back up on screen here. Yeah. And all right. So now we have the full argument in yeah. all its glory. And now, but I wanted to stop it there because now he, he goes back into Surah 2, verse 79, which exactly. again, if you guys haven't seen it, you'll want to catch, uh, you want to catch that uh, whenever this is, uh, this is out. But in my video, in my video, I go through 26 reasons and I just started A, gave a reason, B, gave a reason, C, gave a reason, and uh, went all the way to Z and then ran out of letters. And just off the top of my head, I realized, okay, I've got about three or four more that I can think of right now. So uh, basically, I could give at least 30 reasons. And I'm sure I could come, especially if I asked Sam, hey, what other reasons could you give? I'm sure he could probably give another 10 beyond anything beyond uh, anything I could think of. So we've got basically 30 to 40 reasons very easily that Surah 2, verse 79, cannot possibly be referring to the corruption of the Torah. But notice, Adnan's just taking it for granted. All based on, all based on the Quran saying, King here and saying Pharaoh yeah. here. And so Anand's, Anand's reasoning is, ah, when it's, when it's talking about the ruler of Egypt over here, it uses king, but during the time of Moses, he's called Pharaoh. And so it's using the correct terms and therefore correct, uh, correcting the Bible, even though, even though that dating doesn't actually fit. If you go with the common dating yeah. of the Exodus that we have the most evidence for, he has to push he has to push the, the Exodus a couple centuries later to actually make this argument fit. But if you're willing to grant all that, then you have some miraculous confirmation. It's Sam, it's, it's almost on the level of Muhammad saying all, the, all these wonderful scientific things that weren't confirmed exactly. until today. Uh, 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 the author of the Quran is, is getting these titles right, and this isn't even confirmed until modern archaeology confirms what... Muhammad yeah. is saying. So how do you reject him as a prophet when you have this airtight argument? By the way, we got 1,400 watching live. Go ahead, yes, Sam. Sir. Yeah, just let's say for argument's sake that even around 1450, the pharaoh, the king of Egypt started, they started calling him pharaoh, and therefore it's not a mistake in the Quran. Now, just let's say for argument's sake, if someone wants to nitpick and play his game, uh -huh then I can say that the chapter 12 of the Quran is mistaken because nowhere does Muhammad realize that the name of the person that bought Joseph was mm. Potiphar. He's called El Aziz all throughout the Quran. El Aziz, El, meaning chapter 12. So that means if it's truly a miracle of Allah, then not only should Allah give, quote unquote, the correct title of Pharaoh at that time, king of Egypt, couldn't Allah 
also mesmerize us by giving us the correct Arabic form of Potiphar, but it never appears, right? The name given to Potiphar is Al-Aziz. And ironically, Al-Aziz is one of the names of Allah. And according to Adnan Rashid, who's a Salafi, he believes in what's called Tawheed al-Asma wa Sifat, that the names of Allah, the characteristics of Allah in their definite form, cannot be ascribed to a creature. And yet here, Muhammad ascribes the name of Allah in its definite form, Al-Aziz, to a pagan, therefore committing shirk. You see what happens when you want to play this game? Mm -hmm. You can actually end up <clears throat> not only turning the argument <clears throat> against Adnan, but it ends up proving too much. It mm -hmm. proves that here you have Muhammad ascribing one of the names of Allah to a pagan, therefore, therefore committing shirk. And it also shows that if chapter 12 is really a corrective, then not only... Should it, should it give the so-called correct title of the fair at the time, it should be able to give all the correct names of all the p characters and all the players in the story of Joseph in their Arabic form, such as calling Potiphar, not Al-Aziz, but by the Arabic form of his name. So this, again, is desperate. And more desperate is the fact that I want the audience to get. I want you to get this. Muhammad keeps telling the Jews, your scriptures... <clears throat> I have come to confirm them, not parts of them, not most of them. I confirm them in their totality. These are the scriptures that Allah sent down to you. These are the scriptures that you are to live by and judge by. These are the scriptures that you are to use to judge my veracity. And here's proof that I'm a prophet. I confirm those scriptures. And yet here he wants to tell us that chapter 12 is actually, cor actually correcting the Genesis narrative of Joseph without ever coming out and saying that's what he's doing. But let's say it's correcting it. How would the Jews of Muhammad's time know that Muhammad is correcting the so-called mistake in their book if, as he says, this was something unknown to the 19th century? How is that a corrective? How does that benefit Muhammad's immediate audience? Because, folks, don't forget, the Quran is addressing Muhammad's contemporaries. It's talking to the Jews and Christians at Muhammad's time. For this to be relevant and miraculous, it would have to be also beneficial to the Jews that he's communicating to. But he's just admitting to you. This was unknown until the 19th century. And it's assuming that Genesis is wrong. It's not. But let's go with the argument. So until the 19th century, no one knew, no one and his mother knew that Surat and Yunus was correcting the Genesis account of the Joseph story. Everyone assumed that Surat and Yunus is simply confirming the Genesis narrative in Arabic for those who read Arabic because Muhammad goes out of his way to say that what you have are the incorruptible revelations of God and I confirm them. And yet he's telling us, no, he was correcting them and no one knew this was a corrective. So how does that benefit the Jews at Muhammad's time? Can you help me understand that, David? Um, no, no, I can't. Uh, it, 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 the, I mean, again, going back to the entire the entire approach of the Quran. Jews, I'm confirming your scriptures. Why aren't you confirming mine? Jews, look at my revelations. They line up with your revelations. In fact, the reverse had to be true as well. The only way Muhammad could confirm his revelations, according to Allah himself, was by making sure that they line up with the revelations of the Jews. So in Surah 10, verse 94, Allah says in the Quran to Muhammad, if you are in doubt as to what we have revealed to you, ask those who read the book before you. So Muhammad, according to Allah, if he wants to confirm his revelations, he's supposed to go to the Jews and the Christians to say, hey, here's the revelation I got. Let's see if it lines up with the revelation you got. But according to Adnan, according to Adnan Rashid, the revelations don't line up and the Quran is saying different things. Well, if that's the case, if Muhammad's revelation is saying different things and Adnan is saying, aha, but 14 centuries later, it would be confirmed that Muhammad was right. Wait a minute. <laughs> Muhammad was told, make sure your revelations line up with what their book says. And according to Adnan, it doesn't. It does not. So even if we, the point is, even if we granted everything Adnan is saying, the entire argument of the Quran falls apart. His, according to Adnan Rashid, the revelations in the Quran do not line up with the revelations in the Bible. And yet the Quran is affirming the revelations in the Bible. And the Quran itself is setting up the revelations of the Jews and Christians as the standard 
yes. that the Quran must line up with. So Muslims have this idea, like Adnan has this idea, and almost every Muslim you run into has this idea, that the Quran is the standard, and the Bible has to live up to that standard. The Quran stands in authority over the Bible. Whereas if you actually read the Quran, it's the Bible that stands in authority over the Quran, and the Quran has to match up to the Bible. It has to live up to that standard. And according to Adnan himself, it doesn't. They're saying different things. And so, dude, I, I don't know what to do. I mean, I, I understand that this is, you know, this is popular among Muslims. So, aha, the Christians got it wrong. The Jews got it wrong. Muslims got it right. Dudes, you don't understand. If you're saying we got it, our scriptures got it wrong about anything, Muhammad was a false prophet. Muhammad affirmed our scriptures. If you say, aha, let's attack your scriptures, you're attacking Muhammad's own prophethood. How do you not get sure. this? It's so simple. Yeah, a four-year-old can get this. If I take a four-year-old, and I say, this book says that this book is true, but this book says that this book is a lie. Do you see a problem here? The, the, yeah. kid, the kid will be able to get that. And yet you can line up 1.6 billion Muslims and they cannot understand this. They cannot see the problem no matter what you say, no matter how clear you make it. And we're not supposed to believe that there is a kind of spiritual blindness going on here. All right, Sam, let's... Oh, by, by the way, I just wanted to point out, if, if, if Anand really wanted to just go down the line, Muslim apologists are famous for, for picking and choosing, but you're talking yes. about how you could wreak havoc on them with various titles and stuff, uh, even just even just basic names. So we, we already mentioned we already mentioned um, the author of the Quran thinking that you know two Marys who lived 14 That's centuries right. apart are the same person. So if you want to look yes. at you know you want to go to modern research, and I try got a to, lot more. Yeah, man. try to confirm that. But even even just basic stuff, right? Like Sam, yes, Isa, the name Isa according to the Quran. That, that, that's that's what Muslims think that is some sort of Arabic translation yes. of Jesus' name, of the name of Jesus. When Sam, what's the what's the Arabic translation of the actual name of Jesus? Yeshua. Yeshua. Okay. And, Yeshua. That, and that's what exactly. and that's what and that's what Arab Christians will refer to him as, right? Because that's the Adnan, actual yes. translation. So what so notice notice Adnan's reasoning here. Okay. So we have the actual Arabic translation of Jesus' name, and yet the Quran refers to him. As, as Isa. Isa, which is the Arabic translation of the name Esau, which most certainly was not the name of Jesus, right? That was that was no 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 Jew in around the time of Jesus is going to name his kid Esau right? because that's a, that's that's considered a bad name. He's he's there. Esau is there. Esau and the Edomites were their were their enemies. So uh, so the Quran just gets it wrong, gets the name wrong. And so notice, if we wanted to argue like Adnan, we'd have to say, okay. According to according to Christianity and the Bible, uh, his name was Jesus, which we, that's the that's the Greek version of the of the name uh, Yeshua, and yeah, the Quranic position is that his his Arabic name is Isa, which is an Arabic translation of the name Esau. So, uh, what 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 evidence can we look to? What evidence can we look to to confirm if we go to the first century evidence? Uh, was his name Yeshua or was his name Esau? Yeah, and then we'll look no proof, to see yeah. what modern scholars confirm here. Any any person who's done five seconds of research would say, of course his name's not Esau. Of course his name was Yeshua. No one or even, yeah. even worse than that, and by the way, uh, there's more examples in that part. Even worse than that, we keep talking about Esau, but many people don't focus on this name. The Quran calls John the Baptist Yahya. But John's Arabic name is not Yahya, it'd be Yohannan or Yohanna. And yet, for some reason, the Quran calls John the Baptist Yahya. And I challenge Adnan and any Muslim to show me in any source outside of the Quran, before and during the time of Muhammad, that said that John's Arabic name is Yahya. That's another name that baffles scholars. Now, some person says that it goes back to Mandian sources because they were a group of followers of John the Baptist, and they would call him Yahya Yohanna, right? So they applied the title Yahya to him, but it was a title, but they knew what his Arabic name was, and it wasn't Yahya. So why is the Quran calling John the Baptist Yahya and quote some source other than the Quran, some source before Muhammad, during Muhammad, where you have groups calling John the Baptist Yahya and saying that this is the Arabic equivalent of his Hebrew Hebrew name. You won't find it. Now, David, I have a list in which the Quran that claims to confirm the Torah 
ends, ends up saying things that shows it does anything but corrupt it. For example, we know that according to Genesis, which is what the Jews had at the time of Muhammad, Muhammad said, I believe and I confirm to be the word of God. Abraham was called Abram until he was around the age of 75. Well, here, let me correct myself. It says actually when he was 99 years old. You see? Good. I went back to wow. look at the reference. Sam see Shimon. That? Hey, Sam, that is yes. the, number, right. the, the, the number of Bible mistakes you've committed since I've Man. known you. I can count on one hand, right. but I think that was number four or five that I've ever seen, see you, I've ever seen you make. Even the most sophisticated computer system can make errors, and I just did so. But again, even worse, until he was 99 years old, when Abraham was 99 years old. So his name was Abraham until he was 99, and then God changed his name to Abraham, that's Genesis 17. But the Quran says his name was Abraham even in his youth, chapter 2, verse 160. They said, we heard of the youth, talked of them, he is called Abraham. So here you have the Quran saying it confirms the Old Testament. And yet it contradicts the Old Testament in such minute details showing either, according to Adnan, that Muhammad was an ignoramus, or we can give him a pass and simply say that when he's narrating the story, he's simply going by the most common name that people use to refer to Abraham. Because after all, how many Christians even listening now knew that Abraham used to be called Abraham and his name was later changed to Abraham? So, but again, what I'm doing is I'm showing if I want to nitpick, mm -hmm. I can nitpick and do what Adnan does to the Quran to falsify the Quran, both as it contradicts the Bible and extra Quranic sources. So here's our challenge, Adnan, and I got a lot more. For example, did Pharaoh's wife adopt Moses or Pharaoh's daughter? The Exodus says it was Pharaoh's daughter, but the Quran says it was Pharaoh's wife and so on and so forth. But here's our challenge to Adnan, and I hope he listens carefully. Give us some extra Quranic source showing us that the people before Muhammad called John the Baptist Yahya and assumed Yahya was the Arabic form of his name. Don't quote me Mandian sources that use Yahya as a title for John, but still got the Arabic form of his name correctly. So give me that. Show us any Christian group speaking Arabic that called Jesus Isa as opposed to Yesu. So if you want to play that game, we can play that game too. And I, we got a lot more problems, but hopefully that suffices. Yeah, uh, Sam, just to uh, recap here, and I want to add uh, one point, but uh, on the issue of, of Abraham, right? So the Quran calls Abraham, Abraham, even before, even before he had that name. That was yes. not, that was not his name. He, his name was Abraham. Yes. And God later called, said, your name is now Abraham, right? That's right. And yep. the Quran calls him Abraham even before he actually had the name. Now, yeah. we would not have a problem with that. We wouldn't have a problem with, uh, with uh, Muhammad or uh, a scripture calling him Abraham even before he had the name Abraham. Because if you're, trying yes. to, if you're trying to communicate to people and you're referring to Abraham and that's the name they know, you can call him Abraham. We wouldn't have a problem with that. But it's people like Adnan who are making this an issue. Oh, you called it this before it was this. And therefore you have a, you have a mistake. And so we'd have to regard this according to his standard as a mistake. And the same with Isa, the same with John the Baptist. By the way, Sam. Yes. According to Muhammad, isn't wasn't John the Baptist the first person who even had the name? Yes. If you go to chapter 19 of the Quran and you read from 7 to 13, it even says, so chapter 19 verse 7 specifically, we have given this name to none before him. Chapter now, 19 verse 7 of the Now, Quran. we actually know that this is a corruption of what... What the Luke Bible, says, act, yeah. yeah. What Luke actually said, yeah. yeah. What we have in the actual Bible is that John's fa this was not a family name for John's family, and so they're yeah, asking so why. Says, yeah. Why are you taking this name when this isn't one of your family names? And so, notice, following Adnan's reasoning here, we can say, wait a minute. According to the Bible, uh, of course, there was the name John before John the Baptist, but that name wasn't used in his family. Uh, they, 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 they keep using their same family names over and over again. Why are you using the name John? 
Uh, whereas in Islam, the name itself did not exist. It was a brand new name. When we know from archaeology, <laughs> we know from archaeology, we know we know that the Jews had this name before John the yeah. Baptist. And so we'd have to say, we'd have to say, wait a minute, uh, what does modern research show? Oh, it shows that the Quran's position, that this was a brand new name, is false, and that the Christian position is correct. The name yeah. did exist, it just wasn't but a family name. Here's, here's what's ironic. Mm -hmm. In chapter 19, verse 7 of the Quran, it is technically correct that Yahya was not a name given to anyone before that time. It just wasn't his name. Yes, <laughs> so that's true. And when, so guys, notice the irony here. Laugh. I mean, you got to laugh at this. It is true. The word Yahya, the name Yahya, wasn't given to anyone before John because it's not a Hebrew name. Hebrews did not. And in fact, I'd like to see the word Yahya appear anywhere in the Old Testament. So in one sense... Maybe that's the miracle. Surprise, David. Surprise. The miracle is we have never given this name to anyone before him. In fact, ironically, it wasn't even given to John himself. Surprise, David. Surprise, surprise. But final one I want to make, just final one, if we want to nitpick. And this one is more serious. Mm -hmm. If you go to Genesis 11, 27 to 32, you'll see Abraham's father's name is Terah. He's the son of Terah. Terah is his father. But in chapter 6, verses 74 to 75, specifically verse 74, Abraham's father's name is Azar, or Azar. Here, remember when Abraham said unto his father, Azar, or Azar. Now, I want Adnan to quote any source other than the Quran where, you, you, in fact, I'll, I'll even be generous. I won't limit him to the Old Testament scriptures. Quote any source. Even outside the Old Testament, Christian sources, whatever, that said that Abraham's father's name was not Terah, but Azar or Azar. Everyone to pronounce the Arabic. It does not exist. See, Adnan will have a field day at your expense using your criterion, criterion to destroy the Quran and expose Muhammad as a fraud. And by the way, the reason why I thought it was 75 is because I was going by the number of Ishmael, Ishmael's age. Ishmael was around 13 years old when this announcement was given. So that means Abraham was 75 when Ishmael was born. So you see, my computer sometimes works too much, David. Yeah, Give you, me a... uh, you need to tighten. Up. You need to tighten up, man. You're going to embarrass us, and uh, and your 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 errors are going to be used to uh, to destroy us. Um, so, all right, let's take a couple of uh, comments from Muslims here. Um, Qasim, let's let me go ahead and pull this up. You're about to be schooled, Sam. I said I'm dead. All right, so Qasim here says uh, the gospel. He's correcting us. Oh wait, well, let me let me read this other comment real quick. Uh, Wandrative. Now I can I cannot confirm this, but Wandrative has posted before the Egyptians used the term Pharaoh, they used the term Nisu Bidi, which means sedge and bee. They never used the term king because it's blasphemous to call the Egyptian god monarch as a mere king. <laughs> So they actually had a higher title for it. I, again, I cannot confirm this, but if uh, Wandrative wants to send us uh, send us some links to Please that information, we uh, we would be happy to take a look. And but noted, David, that made my point, didn't it? It mm -hmm. made my point saying, if the Quran is really miraculous, why couldn't it then give us the correct Arabic form of all the names of the main characters in the Joseph story, like Potiphar? Why not give us the Arabic form of Potiphar mm -hmm. as opposed to calling him El Aziz, one of the names of Allah? Mm -hmm. All right, Sam, now you have uh, Qasim's uh, decisive refutation of your position up on the screen. Um, Qasim says, The gospel that were with the Christians in Muhammad's area and time had the gospel which was revealed by Allah, not yeah. Mark, Matthew, Luke, or John. So Qasim, I just want you to confirm your position here and please give us some evidence. So you're saying that the Christians in 7th century Arabia had the true gospel revealed to Jesus, they did not have Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. So you have two things. One, that two claims you got to defend. One, that Christians in 7th century Arabia didn't have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Now, the reason you're going to have a problem here is our earliest record of where the Muslims show, tried to show that Muhammad was right and that Muhammad is confirmed in the gospel, they quoted the gospel of John. They did not quote some imaginary gospel that we no longer have, right? So that's one thing. You have to show that their gospel was not Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, right? Two, you have to show that there was another gospel, some gospel of Jesus, that lasted until 7th century Arabia, right? So notice, according to you, this gospel existed in the 1st century. 
It existed in the second century. It existed in the third century. It existed in the fourth century. It existed in the fifth century. It existed in the sixth century. And it existed into the seventh century. And that's what was being confirmed. So please give us your archaeological evidence, anything, to show that Christians for seven centuries were sharing a gospel of Jesus. And it wasn't Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They had yeah. some other gospels. So show us from the early church fathers, from archaeology, whatever evidence you have, that they were using a gospel that Jesus wrote and not Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, which, again, that's where your earliest Muslims went to when they tried to show that Muhammad's right. That's what they're thinking of as the gospel. They're thinking of the gospel of John, right? So you're saying even, oh, yeah. even, the, or even the early Muslim community was wrong. There was this other gospel that was around for seven centuries. It must have spread all over the place because it, was all, it, was, it made it all the way into Arabia, and that's the gospel that Christians have Please provide your evidence. I eagerly wait for it. Uh, Sam, what do you think about this? By the way, we got yep. fi we got fifteen hundred people watching live, so, so it's a good time. So it's pretty good. Mm -hmm. See, it's a good time, and you got Europe now. Just to confirm what you said, David, because mm -hmm. he's saying give us some evidence from that period of time. We don't need to give you evidence. Ibn Ishaq gives us the evidence, yeah. <clears throat> even though he may be a century later. Still, that shows you that even the Muslim community, the followers of Muhammad, and the followers after them were aware of what the gospel that the Christians had, and he clearly identifies the gospel of John. Guys, I want you, by the way, uh, we're gonna sound like a broken record. All of this information are on our blogs and our websites, answeringmuslims.com, answeringislamblog.wordpress.com, answeringislam.net. Use the materials, because we want you to go to the articles to find the quotations, and use the quotations in your debates, your lectures, and so on. Now. Ibn Ishaq, I'm mean, quoting the English translation by Alfred Guillaume Guillaume. Uh, how do you pronounce that again? Is it Guillaume or Guillaume? Guillaume. Just Guillaume. like just like, like like my friend Guillaume, oh, yeah, yeah, my French right. friend Guillaume. That's the same. It's that's the same right. name. Now I'm going to remember because I heard someone pronounce it Guillaume. Anyway, Alfred Guillaume, who was a leading Islamic scholar, he translated Ibn Ishaq's Sirat Rasulullah in English. And for all you serious students of Islam, you Christians. And David will agree, you got to get this work and study it because it is one of the greatest proofs Muhammad is a fraud. He's not a true prophet of God. And Ibn Ishaq, by the way, was one of those Muslims who believed in the incorruptibility of the Jewish Christian scriptures. He was one of them. But that's another issue. Here in the English translation, pages 103, 104, folks, notice what the gospel happens to be. According to the oldest extent biography on Muhammad's life, edited by a man named Ibn Hisham, who kept this citation intact, because Ibn Hisham was known to expunge things from Ibn Ishaq he didn't like, but he kept this intact. He agreed with it. Now notice what it says. Pages 103-104. Among the things which have reached me about what Jesus, the son of Mary, stated in the gospel... The, wait, the gospel. So when he's, yes, so when the, the early Muslims are using the term the gospel, and he doesn't quote some uh, mysterious gospel that no one's ever heard of, he quotes the gospel that people regard as the gospel. All right, good. Yes, in the gospel that came down to me, which he received from Allah. Oh, it even makes it clear the gospel that Jesus received from God, Allah, for the followers of the gospel, Ahl al Injil. <clears throat> And applying a term to describe the apostle of Allah, meaning, again, he's trying to find a prophecy of Jesus about Muhammad. It is extracted from what John, the apostle, set down for them when he wrote the gospel for them from the testament of Jesus, son of Mary. And he quotes, it's a lengthy citation, he quotes John 15, verse 23 to John 16, verse 1. He quotes that, John 15, verses 23, to chapter 16, verse 1, and he says, this is supposedly a prophecy of Muhammad, but it's taken from the gospel that Allah gave Jesus, which John wrote down for the followers of the gospel. So David, again, I'm not, I keep saying it, I gotta say it again, I'm not the sharpest tool in the shed. That's true. But if this man, if this man says, John wrote the gospel that God gave to Jesus, uh -huh. Does that mean the gospel of John is the revealed gospel of Jesus Christ that God has preserved for us to use and judge by? That's what the early Muslims thought. It's modern Muslims who think otherwise. Okay, there you go. That's the one that says he's the eternal word mm -hmm, who created mm -hmm. all things, who became flesh. 
whom Thomas worshipped as his Lord and God. All right. That, that is correct. Uh, Sam, I'll just have to point out a, a, a few more problems. Um, and by the way, you know, we, we, we're, we're, uh, we're responding to Adnan here. We're going to get back and watch a little more Adnan. But, but guys, we certainly want to take comments like this from Muslims to try and help them because they need help. They're not getting help uh, from their apologists. The only way they're going to hear any of this is, is from us. Um, but think about this. Think about this, Qasim. You go back to the first seven centuries of Christianity. No one has ever heard of any gospel that was written by Jesus. No one. No one's ever heard of that, right? They don't quote it. They don't use it. Um, the church fathers don't use it. Jesus followers don't use it. No one uses, no one uses this. Um, so if there is some other gospel, then Allah needs to show people what in the world that is. Why? Well, you got some problems here. One, he talks about the gospel that Christians had in the seventh century. He says, that's the gospel we're reading. We have it, right? So if we have it, then it's obviously referring to a text that we have. You ask the early, our earliest Muslim reference says it's talking about the gospel of John, which ain't helping you, right? That's not yeah. helping you, right? So that so that's that's one problem. Uh, problem number two, Allah commands us to judge by the gospel, right? We know what Jews mean by the Torah, and the Quran assumes that Christians know what he means when he tells us to judge by the gospel. If he's talking about some completely different book that we've never heard of and no one has any record of, how are we going to judge by a book that we don't have, right? So that's second problem. He's telling us to judge by it, right? Sam, there's a kind of rule in uh, uh, ethics and moral philosophy, ought implies can. If I say you have to do this, I'm, I'm presupposing that you have the ability to do it. If Allah commands Christians to judge by the gospel, that's assuming that Christians have access to this gospel. If our Muslim friends are saying, no, this refers to some gospel that you don't have, why in the name of common sense is Allah telling us to judge by a book that we don't have, right? So that's that's another problem. Why is your God telling us to judge by a book that we don't have? Uh, notice, uh, uh, Qasim, this would be like me coming to you and say, uh, you need to judge by the book Slub Gob. And you say, what, what are you talking about, Slub Gob? And I say, I'm not telling you. I'm not going to tell you what this book is. I'm not going to tell you where it is. I'm not going to tell you how to find it. But you have to judge by it. You'd say, what are you talking about? I don't even know what you're talking about. That's what you're telling us Allah is saying. Right? He's saying, judge by the gospel that you don't have, and you have no idea what in the world what in the world Allah is even talking about here. Right? So you're telling us that your God is a horrible communicator. He's uh, he's telling us to do something that we can't possibly that we can't possibly do. Uh, further, uh, also, so that's chapter five, verse forty-seven. Chapter five, verse sixty-eight of the Quran. Allah says that we have no ground to stand upon unless we stand upon the Torah and the gospel and all the revelation that has come to us. Right? But you're saying Allah is saying that we, we have no ground to stand upon unless we stand upon this gospel that we don't have. So basically, we have no ground to stand upon at all because we don't have that gospel that, that your God tells us that we have to stand upon, right? So your God is completely incoherent. Um, hmm. So in, in, addition to, in addition to all of that, from the second century onward, right? So you had the first century and the gospels, the gospels circulated as Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, separate, separate books that went out and were copied. In the second century, the four gospels are compiled into what's called the fourfold gospel. They're treated as yes, a unit. Right. They're treated as a unit called the fourfold gospel or just the gospel. So it makes sense to Christians to say that Jesus brought the gospel, right? The gospel just means good news, right? When you're talking about a text, when you're you when you're talking about a text, if you're talking to a Christian about the text and you say, yeah, the gospel, if you're talking to a Christian after the second century, that means those that fourfold gospel, the fourfold gospel. It means Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And so that's the Christian understanding. And so here's the problem. If that's the Christian understanding, if you walk up to a Christian and say, hey, you've got the gospel, you're reading the gospel, that means they're reading the, that collection of the four gospels. This would be like me saying, yes. it would be like me talking to you as a Muslim and saying, hey, you read the Quran. You would assume that I mean that book that you have that's called the Quran. Here's the thing. If that's, if, if that's what Christians know and understand by that word, the gospel, but what Allah means is some different book that they don't have access to, that they've never even heard of, and that was written by Jesus, which no one for the first seven centuries has ever even heard of, then Allah is the absolute worst communicator in all of history. Again, this would be like right. me coming up to you and saying, Muslim, judge by the Quran. You have no ground to stand upon unless you stand upon the Quran. And then I leave and you say, cool, I'm going to judge by the Quran. And my followers come along later and say, what, you idiot? That's not talking about that Quran. It's talking about this other book that you don't even have. You'd be like, why did you tell me to judge by something I don't have? What are you talking? Why, why would you tell me to stand upon something that I don't have? What? Why are you the worst communicator ever? 
But that's what you're telling us about your God. And so that's what Christians understood by the text of the gospel. They understood the text of Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. The earliest Muslim reference we have to the gospel affirms that he's talking about the gospel of John, which confirms our... So you have seven centuries to find us some reference to some mysterious gospel of Jesus and say that, that is what, that's what Christians had. Um, if you have nothing, every shred of evidence we have from all of history tells us that the gospel that Christians knew as the text of the gospel was Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And this is even confirmed by Muslims. And it's even confirmed by Muslims today. When Muslims try to show that the Quran is right and that and that Muhammad's mentioned in the gospel, where do they go? The gospel of Jesus? No. What, why, how did this thing exist for seven centuries and then mysteriously disappear? Not just disappear right. from the planet, but disappeared from all of history so that there is not a, a record of it anywhere. How did this happen? It's, it, you, what you're saying would have to actually be a miracle. So somehow, mysteriously, Allah comes along, says, Christians judge by the gospel, and then Allah slaps, snaps his fingers and makes it, makes it disappear right after he orders Christians to judge by it. Your position is completely, utterly, totally incoherent. Why are you advocating a completely, utterly, totally incoherent position that flies in the face of all evidence and is contradicted not only by Christian sources, but also by your own Muslim sources? Why are you doing that? Because your religion forces you to adopt this absurd position. Yeah. If you don't, yeah, but, yeah, go ahead. No, go ahead. Now, I was going to just confirm what you said. I'm going to give them some historical references to prove what you said about Guys, Christians, I want you to pay attention carefully to what David said. Don't just listen in one ear out the other. Please, by the power of the Holy Spirit, I ask in Jesus' name, you remember these points. These are the points you're going to need to bring up to silence the Muslim assault against the Bible. Did you hear what he said? He goes, early on, the four Gospels were not called four Gospels. They were called the one Gospel. And let me give you now historical proof for this. This comes from F.F. F. Bruce a late renowned 20th century scholar of the New Testament, evangelical Trinitarian scholar, in his book called The New Testament Documents, Are They Reliable? A must read, by the way, for all serious Christian apologists, one of the best books written on the historical, <clears throat> textual, integrity, veracity of the New Testament, especially the Gospels. Again, F.F. F. Bruce, The New Testament Documents, Are They Reliable? Page 23. Guys, notice who he's going to cite. At a very early date, it appears that the four Gospels were united in one collection. They must have been brought together very soon after the writing of the Gospel according to John. This fourfold collection was known originally as the Gospel singular, not the Gospels in plural, in the plural. There was only one Gospel narrated in four records, the Gospel singular, even though there's four, because they didn't consider them four different Gospels, but four versions of the one gospel. So they called them the gospel. Now he can, goes on to say, okay? Narrative four records distinguished as according to Matthew, according to Mark, and so on. About A.D. 115, Ignatius, Bishop of Antioch, he was a disciple of the apostles who was martyred for his love for Jesus, refers to the gospel singular as an authoritative writing, and as he knew more than one of the four gospels, it may well be that by the gospel Sans phrase, he means the fourfold collection which went by that name. So early on, the church started speaking of the gospel that was written from four perspectives. So that at the time of Muhammad, to say to a Christian, judge by the gospel, to a Christian, you just told him, judge by the gospel narrated by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And then one more line of evidence that the Quran is confirming the gospel that we have in New Testament. And again, a lot of apologists have not used this particular argument, and I didn't originate this, but it's an argument that I used early on. And I don't know who actually who I heard it from. Oh, I think I was reading Yusuf Ali. That's what it was. I was reading Yusuf Ali's commentary on chapter 48, verse 29 of the Quran, because I want you to see this, David. I'm going to read the last part of it. Folks, pay attention. Here the Quran quotes a parable that's only found in Mark's gospel. Only in Mark's gospel, and it says this is taken from the gospel. Chapter 48, verse 29 of the Quran. And their description in the gospel. Now notice, David, that assumes they had the gospel, right? Because it's appealing to Muhammad's contemporaries at that time and saying, the description of the Muslims in your gospel, mm -hmm. not some gospel that doesn't exist, what you have now. And their description in the gospel is like unto a seed 
produce that sends forth its sprout, then makes it strong. It then becomes stout and stands firm on its stem, delighting the sowers that he may cause the disbelievers to boil with rage at the sight of them. So he's saying this parable is in your gospel, Christians. And let me show you where he got it from. It's Mark 4, 27 to 28, but I'll read 26, 29 for the context. Now, folks, tell me if this sounds similar to what the Quran just quoted. Mark 4, 26 to 29. He said, Jesus speaking, the kingdom of God is like a man who scatters seed on the ground. He sleeps and rises night and day, and the seed sprouts and grows. He does not know how, for the earth bears fruit by itself, first the blade, then the head, then the full seed in the head. But when the grain is ripe, immediately applies the sickle because the harvest has come. So here the Quran is echoing this parable, and this is not my opinion. Yusuf Ali, in his English translation of the Quran and commentary, page 1400, note 4917, that's where I found it. Now I remember because I was reading Yusuf Ali. Page 1400, footnote 4917. The similitude in the gospel is about how the good seed is sown and grown gradually, even beyond the expectation of the sower. And notice what he cites. Mark 4, 27, 28. He quotes it. The seed should spring and grow up. He knoweth not how. For the earth bringeth forth fruit of herself, first the blade, then the ear, and after that, the full corn in the earth. So here you have a Muslim, and he's not the only one. I have another citation by <clears throat> Al-Mawduri. He says the same thing, Al-Mawduri, but I won't read it. For the sake of time. Here you have not one Muslim, two Muslims admitting that this parable that Muhammad said is in the gospel at his time is taken from Mark 4, 27, 28. And folks, it's only Mark that has this parable. So now, David, help me again with logic because, you know, you're the philosopher, right? And, you know, I, I, I felt when I was a kid, so it damaged my brain. If it's telling Muslims this, I'm sorry, it's telling Christians at the time of Muhammad, this parable is in your gospel. And he's quoting a parable only found in Mark. Doesn't this suggest that Muhammad is confirming that Mark's gospel is the gospel that God gave to Jesus? Uh, well, yeah, if you were actually looking for any sort of real evidence or confirmation. But I'm guessing the Muslims here are going to say, no, this was also in this imaginary gospel that no one has, no one had, has access to. Okay. Um I mean, okay, that, that, that's what they keep doing, right? <laughs> or, yeah, all right. Okay, I tried. <laughs> and by the way, someone asked a question uh -huh. about where does the Quran call Potiphar al-Aziz? It's in chapter 12 of the Quran, but two particular passages I'll give you. It's in chapter 12, but chapter 12, verse 30, and chapter 12, verse 51. 12, verse 30, 12, verse 51. He's called al-Aziz. And in the Halali Khan translation, it says the Aziz. Uh -huh. It even says the Aziz. 12.30 and 12.51 of the Quran. 12.30 and 12.51. Yep. Shout out to uh, Aheron, Michael Weyburn, and uh, Brooke for joining the Boom Squad. Um, so, all right. Well, we've gone through Qasim's response. Qasim, uh, it, it's just funny that these guys come in here and they act like they're schooling us when they're they're just, I mean, they're, they're proving two things. One, there is no coherent Islamic position on this. You have to just completely go against all evidence and all of reality. Two, they're showing what Islam does to a person's ability to think logically and rationally, right? You can't, you can't, you, you, you can't get, they can't get their minds around. Wait a minute. The Quran is affirming the text that Christians had in the seventh century. Um, our Christian records show that that referred to the gospels that we understand as gospels. The Muslim records show that what the, that what they understood was that this is referring to the gospels that Christians have in their gospel. That's uh, if we want to say it's some other gospel, then it means that Allah could not communicate clearly that uh, Allah was commanding Christians to do something they couldn't possibly do. That Allah was saying that they have no ground to stand upon unless they stand upon something that they didn't even have. Completely incoherent, and we would have to believe that for seven centuries the Christian gospel was a book that no one has any record of as even existing anywhere in history that's what, and Muslims will Muslims will go to that and they'll say that is exactly right everything you said is exactly right Allah is the worst communicator ever uh, Christians had this other book that we have no record of um, and Christians and Muslims and everyone during the, the during those th that time of history who thought that the the, the gospel of the the Christians referred to Matthew Mark Luke and John they were all wrong because Allah is such a horrible communicator Muhammad's a horrible communicator everyone's everyone's just a horrible communicator and we're right because this is what our apologists have come up with as their their defense of Islam this is so so utterly yeah. ridiculous 
right. Just one real quickly. Uh, Protestant believer is my brother. He's a mod. And then you have a guy named Catholic by God's grace. Please, let's not turn this into a Catholic versus Protestant no. debate. No. Please, guys. And guys, uh, guys, I love you for the sake of the Lord. Please, no Warren, sectarian division right now. Yeah, moderators, uh, moderators. If uh, one, if you're a moderator, don't be doing that. And two, if someone starts doing that, then warn them and then uh, time them out. And if they keep up with it, then block them. Um, all right. So, uh, all right. Here, here we have another comment, Sam. Uh, yeah, guys, I know we're I know we're dealing with that non stuff, but at, at non stuff uh, the stuff at non saying is no more sophisticated or correct than, than what the Muslims in the in the chat yes. here are saying. Uh, here we have Anan Al Shair. He says Allah. Here he goes, Sam. Gosh, it's like a broken record. We 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 can sit here and give dozens of refutations of a point, and they will reply by just posting the same point. All right? I mean, the, the, so look, Anan Anan here says. Allah revealed Torah to Moses, peace be upon him, and Injil to Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. But Jews and Christians changed and corrupted their own scriptures. Then Allah revealed the last revolution, Quran, to Muhammad, <laughs> peace be upon him. Adnan, for the past week and a half, and really for the past 10 years, over 10 years, we've been asking Muslims, can you give us a single verse of the Quran that says that the Jews corrupted the Torah? and that the Christians corrupted the gospel. Can you give us a single reference? Can you give us a single reference in the Quran that says they changed and corrupted? And when you can't, because guess what? We can give you passage after passage after passage after passage after passage in your Quran that affirms the scriptures that the people of the book had, that affirms the inspiration of the Torah and the gospel, that affirms the preservation of the Torah and the gospel, that affirms the ongoing authority of the Torah and the gospel. So you've got all of these passages saying one thing, saying, yep, the Torah and the gospel are good as gold according to Allah, the Quran, and Muhammad. And then Muslims will look at all of that evidence and say, Nope, corrupted. That's what happened. Guys, notice you have the same problem over and over again. All evidence that is available in any way, any shape, any form proves you're wrong. And you'll just keep saying the wrong thing that is completely refuted by the evidence. And you just don't care. How do you call yourselves the people of truth when you're like this? How do you call yourself the people of truth when you'll say, the gospel's, oh, the gospel's been corrupted. I can quote your God saying no one can change his words. I can quote your God in your book saying that he inspired the Torah and the gospel, saying that Christians and Jews in the seventh century still had the Torah and the gospel, showing him saying over and over and over again to the people of the book at his time, I affirm that which you have, that which is with you. We can show your prophet Muhammad telling the Jews to bring him a copy of the Torah and when they bring him a copy of the Torah, he says, I believe in you and in the one who revealed you. His belief in the Torah was parallel to his belief in Allah, right? I believe in you and in the one who revealed you. So I believe in you both. But you're saying, no, he didn't really believe in that. Well, maybe he didn't really believe in God then, right? Because you're because they're the same thing. Muhammad affirms in Jamia Turbidi, Jews and Christians still had the Torah and the gospel. He appeals to the Torah and the gospel uh, for their prof so-called prophecies about him. Uh, he commands Jews to judge by the Torah, which makes no sense if it's corrupt. And Allah even says that Jews don't need, Jews do not need the uh, they don't need Muhammad or the Quran because they have the Torah. They already have the Torah. That makes no sense if the Torah has been corrupt. Allah commands Christians to judge by the gospel. That makes no sense if the gospel has been corrupt. Allah says we have no ground to stand upon unless we stand upon the Torah and the gospel. None of that makes sense if the if our scriptures have been corrupt. We look at all of that. We look at all of that and we say, hey, can you give us one verse that says our, our books have been corrupted? No, you can't. You can twist some scriptures, but when we actually read them, they have nothing to do with the corruption of our scriptures. You look at all of that and say, yep, our book is affirming that your scriptures have been corrupted. And then you you call yourselves the people of truth and you tell us to, that we have to go to your religion. How do you expect us to go to your religion when, as far as I can tell, your religion completely destroys a person's ability to think clearly about any of this? Why would I want to convert to a religion that is going to destroy my ability to even think logically about any of these things? Why would I want to do that? Show me that, show, yeah, show me that your religion is not demonic and that it actually encourages rational thought and going where the evidence points. Show me that. Show me that. Yeah. But all I ever see is, nope, here's this mountain of evidence that proves me wrong. I have no evidence to prove me right. Therefore, convert to my religion. It's so ridiculous and stupid. All right. What do you think, Sam? No, I was going to say, which further confirms that it is spiritual in nature, that there is demonization taking place, yep. that it is Satan 
and his evil spirits, the kingdom of darkness, who is working to blind people, to oppress people, to hinder people from seeing the truth clearly. Because when you have Muslims who are constantly perverting their own Quran, doing the very thing to their Quran, which the Quran accuses Jews and Christians of doing, misinterpreting our scriptures, and feel no shame, you know there's something demonic there, and we need to pray for them that by the power of the Holy Spirit, the grace of Jesus Christ our Lord, they'll escape the snares of the devil and come to know Jesus Christ, their only hope of salvation, who loves and adores them and died for their salvation. So, yeah, I mean, this is just more confirmation. That's all it is. Yep. Just simply confirming there's a spiritual battle, folks. So we're not materialists. We're not atheists. We're not agnostic. Our battle, as Paul says in Ephesians 6, 12, our battle is not with flesh and blood, but our battle is with <clears throat> the <clears throat> princes, dominions, and powers in the heavenly realm, with the prince of the power of the air. And the way we defeat them is through prayer, through fasting, through studying the word, affirming the word, proclaiming the word, you know, just living it out for the glory of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Until every Muslim knee bows and every Muslim tongue confesses Jesus Christ is Lord. So it is a real battle, folks, and we have the victory by the blood of Jesus, by the power of the Holy Spirit, and the weapons that God has given us. One of which is studying the Word, the Bible, proclaiming the Word, and defending it by the power of the Holy Spirit. Why do you think there's this attack on the Bible? Because Satan knows that's the sword of the Spirit. It's our weapon. But he wants to disarm us and take our sword away and help us, cause us to lose confidence in, in God's sword, His Word, so that we cannot use it against Him to destroy His kingdom. Yeah. But it will never happen. We will use it because it is God's word. It is the sword of the spirit for the glory of Jesus. Yeah, Sam, uh, and I'm just looking at these responses. So no, guys, notice the pattern here. Again, this morning I posted a video where I, I go through the Muslim sources. I, I give 26 reasons that Surah 2 verse 79 cannot possibly be referring to the corruption of the scripture. That, that's how we go, all right? Um, we pull out sources. We go through our sources. We go through your sources. We go through history. We go through everything. And then the, the response is from Muslims. We'll just we'll just repeat the same thing over and over again. That's been completely refuted and destroyed. And if you look at what else is going on, then then they just post nonsensical responses to everything. So Abdul Rahman Muhammad says, "Let's go by the Gospel and Torah as Quran says." So notice he's saying, "Let's go by the Gospel and the Torah as the Quran says." So he admits he admits yeah, yeah. he admits that the Quran says that that we need to go to the, the gospel and the Torah. He says, we follow more of the teachings of Jesus than you do. Jesus prayed to God as we pray uh, to God. Right. The Bible the says Christ. Jesus was a Messiah and he was sent by God. <laughs> um, Sam, uh, last, yeah. time I last, last time I checked, Jesus referred to God when he prayed. And of course yeah. the Muslims, once again, like beating drums are gonna say, what, what why, why is Jesus praying? Let's just ignore the fact that you're Trinitarians. Let's ignore yeah. the fact that you're Trinitarians, that you believe Father, Son, and Holy Spirit have an eternal relationship. And that when the Son becomes incarnate as Jesus of Nazareth, he would continue that relationship. But since he has taken on human flesh, he would continue that relationship through prayer. Let's forget that all of that makes perfect sense in light of Christian theology and just go, oh, how could how could God pray if Jesus is God, right? Let's just yeah. say the same thing over and over and over again. But notice, wow. even, even here, Jesus prayed as we prayed. Sam? Yes. Does, does did Jesus pray? Uh, did Jesus pray as Muslims pray? We want to keep this short because we want to get through a couple yeah, of these yeah. silly comments. But yeah, uh, uh, David, what's ironic is they're quoting Matthew twenty six thirty nine. I know that's hilarious. <laughs> and here's what's hilarious. Well, you see why David's laughing. Two things. Number one, guys, go read Matthew twenty six. Read it. Read the read the verse. Jesus. Yeah, right there it says, and he fell down prostrate on his face. And you see prostrate ah, like ah, Muslims, like Muslims. Ah, but he says, Father. <laughs> If it be possible, take this cup from me. But then he goes on and say, nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. So two things. He calls God Father. And I'm going to challenge Qasim and any Muslim we want it here because he's going to post the comment. Right, David? If he says it, I want him to say, mm -hmm. oh, Allah, you are my father and Muhammad's father. Please post that. You say you pray like Jesus, right? We want you to say, O oh Allah, you are my father. O oh Allah, the father of Muhammad and of all believers. We want you to post that so we can now clip it, and it's going to be saved on this session. Secondly, you're quoting a verse which the context has to do with Jesus accepting the Father's will to be handed over to the Romans to be beaten to bloody pulp, whipped to the point of death, 
nailed on the cross to die for our sins and then be raised to life. Do you seriously want to quote that verse? Which the context is not only Jesus praying to God as his father, but accepting the father's will for him to die on the cross for our sins. And the same chapter where earlier on, if you go to Matthew 26 and you read Matthew 26, 26 to 28, where Jesus breaks the bread and he says, this is my body broken for you. And he takes the cup and he says, this cup is my blood, which is shed for the forgiveness of the sins of many, showing that his death atones for us and saves us from our sins. You really want to quote that chapter? Okay. There you go, David. Yeah. Now, uh, th this is what is absolutely I mean, it's simultaneously hilarious and so sad because we see the same thing over and over again, right? It's exactly what we've been saying this entire time, right? You've got the Gospel of Matthew. You've got the Gospel of Matthew, the message of which is that Jesus died on the cross for sins and rose from the dead, completely contradicts Islam. Muslims, Muslim apologists, rather, they go through there, they look for anything that they can twist and distort to show that, it, you know, Christianity actually lines up with Islam. They think they find a verse Right now, Sam, when Muslims actually quote this, if you look at their memes, right, they'll 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 have they'll have this part of the quote. And he went a little farther and fell on his face and prayed. They'll quote that and say, "You see, Jesus was a Muslim." They will leave out literally the the rest of the verse, which it says that Jesus referred to God as Father. Why, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, guys? This is this is yeah. trinitarian. This is trinitarian. We know this. Right? They'll leave that part out about Jesus referring to the Father. They'll leave that out. And then they'll pass this around amongst themselves. You see, Jesus prayed like a Muslim. This is the miraculous confirmation of Islam and the, the refutation of Christianity. Notice, they'll go through the entire Gospel of Matthew, 28 chapters. They'll find one verse that yeah. they think lines up oh, with Islam. Boy. And then they can't even quote the entire verse. They have to chop part of it off and then pass that off. Literally reading the refu the rest of the verse is a refutation of your claim. All you have to do is read the rest of the, read the entire not the whole passage, read the the entire verse, and it refutes your position. It, it it shows that your apologists are liars. And Muslims will go to that and say, "You see, this is their miraculous confirmation of Islam." Muslims, why are you like this? Why why are your apologists like this? Why are they so utterly deceptive? Yeah. Do you know why your apologists are this deceptive? Because you let them be this way, right? You don't hold them accountable, right? If, if if me and Sam just got on here and spouted a bunch of complete nonsense and made things up left and right and lied left and right, there would not be all these people <laughs> watching us. Christians would be contacting us. I would get hundreds of messages afterwards saying, David, why are you making stuff up? In Islam, you could just make stuff up and people love you for it. The more you lie about your own religion and Christianity, the more people love you. How is this, how is this the religion of truth? How is this the religion of truth when it encourages people to be like this? Guys, come on, just think. I'm we're trying to break through. I believe that you Muslims are created in the image of God. You're given your rationality and your intellect for a reason, to spot falsehood and to go towards the truth. And yet your religion tells you to turn all of that off and just mindlessly keep saying the same ridiculous things over and over. You know what else we got over here, Sam? What do you have? But Jesus and Luke says, as for those enemies of mine, bring them here and slaughter me. That's that's what <laughs> we don't need Things to go through that. Universe. It's already been pointed out to them. It's already been pointed out. Guys, read the passage. Jesus is telling a parable. He's telling a story. It's a ruler in the story who says that. Why? Once again, Muslims, why do you take a passage where Jesus is telling a story? You cut out just that one little part. You pretend that it's Jesus commanding the disciples around him to go and kill. You lie about Jesus. You lie about what the text says. You lie about your own religion. You lie about our religion. You lie about our book. You lie about your book. You lie about God. You lie about Jesus. You lie about Muhammad. All you do is lie. And then you tell us, come to the truth. Come to the religion of truth. Are you joking? I feel like, man, I feel like, I feel like someone's just going to come out one day and say, ha ha, we were joking the entire time. It was a big prank. Islam was a big prank. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, that again confirms, David, what I'm saying like a broken record. And someone said it, I think Sophia or somebody else. No, it wasn't Sophia, someone else. The spiritual blindness is amazing, but that's what it is. It is truly Satan working because he doesn't want Muslims to leave Muhammad and the Quran because as long as they follow Muhammad, he belongs, they belong to Satan. As long as they follow the Quran, they belong to Satan. But once their eyes are opened by the power of the almighty eternal spirit of the Father and the Son, the Holy Spirit of the living God, 
and see who Jesus is. They will escape the snares of Satan and fall in love with the true Jesus who will save them to the uttermost, who is almighty to save all who trust in him. And that's our prayer. Lord Jesus, use us to bring them. And they're coming. Praise the name of Jesus. Yeah, Sam, Sam, let, look, look at this because it's so sad. So this is, this is a new comment. Still going on down here. This is Muhammad Sheikh. Look at this. Muhammad Sheikh says, Acts 17 apologetics. You just destroyed Christianity by that verse. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You That's just true. said Jesus prayed to God. <laughs> How could Jesus pray to God if according to Christianity, he is God? Explain. Guess what, Muhammad? Oh. I, I already explained. Right? One, we're not Unitarians. We're Trinitarians. According to us, let me break this down again. According to us, Father, Son, Holy Spirit exist eternally in a relationship within the one nature of God. So the Son, the Son, the Divine Son enters creation as Jesus of Nazareth. Now, Father and Son have had an eternal relationship. Sam, as James White likes to ask, if the Son becomes incarnate, yeah, right. is if the Son in, becomes incarnate, takes on a human nature, do Muslims expect him to become an atheist? Is he supposed to become exactly. an atheist? Or is he supposed to continue his relationship with the Father from all eternity? Exactly. Right? So, 100%. So notice, you can re you can reject all this, Muslims. You can reject and say all of that is false, but you can't say it doesn't make sense. It, you, what you have to say is, okay, if Christians are right, as a Muslim, I do not believe they're right. But if they're right, then you have three divine persons within the one nature of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Son takes on flesh, enters creation as Jesus of Nazareth. Now that he is in human flesh, now that he has a human nature, he would continue that relationship that he's had with all it, from all eternity with the Father. But because he has a human nature now, he would continue it through prayer. Therefore, therefore, it makes perfect sense in light of Christian theology, in light of the claims of Jesus and his followers, that Jesus would pray, even though he is the eternal son. All of that fits together. So you can reject it and say, I don't, yeah, okay, it all fits together, but it's false. You can do that. To just come in here and hey, I I'm gonna I'm gonna think that Christians are Unitarians and that if Jesus is God, then it makes no sense for Jesus to pray because then he'd be praying to himself. I'm just gonna do that and I'm gonna say, boy, you just destroyed your religion. Notice they brought up the they brought up the verse. Ha ha! Here's the verse that confirms Islam. We read the verse; it completely destroys Islam. Then they say it destroys us, even though it's exactly what we believe, and we all affirm that. Hundred percent. So, Sam, yeah. but, but but Sam, just because just because uh, yeah. just because we want to show how bad this is, Sam. Yes. Our Muslim friends here, they think yeah. it's a problem that Jesus prayed, even though, given Christian theology, yes. if Christian theology is true, of course he's going to pray. He has a human nature. He's the divine son. He has an eternal relationship with the Father that he would continue having that communion with the Father through prayer. All of that makes sense. And they act like yeah. they stump us. Ha ha! You, you Christians never thought of this, have you? Uh, if Jesus is God, how could he pray? Boy, you guys never thought of that one. Thousands well, Sean, and th thousands of times. But Sam, yeah. since that's not a problem with us, do Muslims actually have a problem here that they're not recognizing? Uh, so, so, David, you don't remember. You got busted, remember? Because Allah does not pray to Muhammad. Okay? Now, guys, we've been over this. We've done sessions, even on... David's uh, channel, you'll find sessions we did on Allah praying and worshiping versus Jesus praying and worshiping. But again, for the sake of time, because there is a section that Don Rashid brings up Bible passages or passage of the New Testament to show that the Quran acknowledges the New Testament's corrupt. But anyway, guys, remember these three verses. Now, unfortunately, there are Muslims who, again, are doing the very thing the Quran accuses Jews and Christians of doing. Deliberately mis- translating, twisting what the Quran says, but this time they're doing it with their quote-unquote pen because they're not translating the Arabic accurately. But Palmer does translate accurately. Palmer translates the words accurately. Remember these three verses, chapter 2, verse 157, chapter 33, verse 43, 33, verse 43, and chapter 33, 56. Now, Palmer does an excellent job, excellent job, of translating the Arabic and you don't even need to read the Arabic if you can get an online Quran browser that gives you the Arabic and Arabic transliteration you can see the words for yourselves here chapter 2 verse 157 chapter 33 verse 43 chapter 33 verse 56 let's start with 2 157 
These on them are <clears throat> blessings from the Lord and mercy, and they it is who are guided. Now here Palmer then translate the verb as prayer, but it's salawat, salawat, salawatun. Upon them are the salawatun of their Lord, of their Lord and his rahma, rahmatun. Salawatun, salawat, ask any Arabic speaker. Don't give them the context, just say, what does salawat mean? And look at any lexical source. Salawat means prayers. And here it says, upon them are the prayers of their Lord and his mercy. So Allah prays for believers and bestows his mercy on them. But here, 33, 43. He it is who prays for you. He it is who prays for you, Muslims, and his angels. Huwa alladhi yusalli. Yusalli. Ask again any Arabic speaker. Don't tell them the context. Say, what does salla mean? Salah, that's prayer. But it says, Allah, Salah, you salli. Allah prays for Muslims. And the angels also pray. Now notice what Allah prays. When he prays for Muslims, notice what he's praying. He it is who prays for you and his angels to bring you forth out of the darkness into the light, for he is merciful to the believers. Now before I go into the final passage, David, help me understand this. Allah needs to pray to bring Muslims out of darkness into his light? He can't just do it. He has to pray to do that or pray for that to be done. I'm confused. Mm -hmm. It says Allah prays and the angels pray with Allah to bring believers out of darkness into light. Why would Allah need to pray to bring Muslims out of darkness into light when I thought he's the one who does bring people out of darkness into light? I'm baffled, David. Sa Sam, you're, you're, being, you're being dumb here. You don't understand that he's dumb. not praying to the Muslims. He's praying for oh. the Muslims. Right. He's praying for Muhammad yeah. and for the Muslims. How are you, how are you, how are you missing this? So, wow, uh, what a devastating reputation. And let me give him the final one. Verily, chapter 33, verse 56. Now, in case you doubt Allah prays, he joins a group. It's group prayer. It's group time. Let's gather together. Friday. <laughs> yeah, come on. It's a group prayer. It's Friday, Friday. Got to get together and pray on Friday. It's your birthday. <laughs> Verily, God and his angels pray. You saloon. You saluna ala and a nabi. Allah, Allah and his angels pray. Not to, but for the prophet. And you who believe, pray for him. You believe, pray for him, sallu, and salute him with the salutation. So now, again, let me understand this. Allah joins a group, the angels, and it's a group thing, a group activity. This group, of which Allah is a part of, are praying for Muhammad. So if prayer means prayer when it comes to the angels, why then would it mean something different when it says Allah is joining them in praying for Muhammad? Mm -hmm. Uh, so notice, notice the pattern here, uh, ladies and gentlemen. We got Muhammad Sheikh. <laughs> says uh, so. The Muslims brought up a verse. Muslims brought up a verse. Matthew twenty six thirty nine, saying, "Aha! This confirms that Jesus prayed like us." Uh, we actually read the verse. Jesus refers to God as Father. Why? Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Um, so we pointed that out and pointed out that. No, if that's how Jesus prayed, then he most certainly did not pray like a Muslim. And if that's the verse you're going to and you're confirming that Jesus said that, then great, your religion is false. Because according to Islam, Allah is a father to no one. You don't call Allah father. Muslims do not call God father. You don't do it. You don't call Allah your father. So therefore, the verse that you went to completely destroyed your claim. So what do they do? They change the subject. Ha ha! Well, if Jesus is God, why is he praying? We pointed out that actually, according to... Christian theology, that makes perfect sense because we're not Unitarians, we're Trinitarians. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Son talks to the Father, right? So it makes perfect sense in light of Christian theology of the doctrine of the Trinity and the Incarnation. You can say you reject it, but you can't say it doesn't fit together. And then our Muslim friends, of course, don't realize that if they've got a problem with that, well, they are supposedly Unitarians. And if they're Unitarians, and we know that Allah in the Quran prays, and by the way, it's not just in the Quran, ladies and gentlemen, it's in the Hadith as well. We've got yeah. Allah praying. So Allah prays, and you guys are Unitarians, then that means that Allah is not, he's either talking to himself, he's praying to himself, or he's praying to some other God who's greater than him. So you're the ones with the problems, not us. Side note, we've pointed this out before. 
anyway, we, we, we go on these live streams and sometimes we go for two hours. Sometimes we go for three hours. We've even gone almost four hours yeah, on live streams. We're not, we're going to, we're going to go ahead and cut this off so we don't go too long. But, uh, we've said before, guys, you are welcome to download this live stream to cut out any particular re response that you want and to post it on your own channel. And you can actually, you can actually get a lot of videos for your channel just like that. Like our response right there. Uh, uh, that that whole response we just did. You can take you can download the, the 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 two hour live stream, cut out that part which is a few minutes long where we actually show all the problems with this Muslim objection. You can take that out, uh, load that to your own channel, title it if Jesus is God, who was he praying to or something like that, and people people will watch it. And keep in mind we are not stingy with our material. I've been stealing material from Sam for years. I don't even give him credit, right? You don't have to credit us. We don't care. Absolutely We're not. <laughs> Uh, so take our stuff, use it. Uh, also, if you like some response we give and, and, and you speak uh, multiple languages, go ahead and post a video in your own language saying the same thing. You, you don't have to credit us. You don't have to say, hey, I got this from Sam Shimon or something like that, or I got this from David Wood. You can just say it in your own language. Put put it out there. We're we're not stingy. We you we're, This, this material is out there for everyone else. All right, Sam, uh, uh, let's go ahead and, gosh, I wanted to keep this to two hours. We're a little over. I want to respond to one yeah, more comment. I wanted to post one more comment, and then we I want to go and just see what Adnan says on Surat yeah, Surat Sur 2. Before you do that, it, the rest of it is going to be on 4171, saying 3, and First John 5, 7, and then the crucifixion and contradiction in the gospel accounts. How, how did Muhammad know this? So it's going to be about 10 more minutes, so it's up yeah. to you if you want to do a no, part no, no. two or you want to go through it. It's up to you. Uh, yeah, I, I just want to play what he says about Surah two, verse seventy nine, because then I'll tell then I'll tell everyone. All right, now go go to my go to my recent video, and they can watch that. And if people want us to continue on that, or uh, uh, or in, in in a part two, or or talk about something else, that's uh, that's fine. But check this out, Sam. Yeah, what is it? Freak me out. Guys, have have we had one coherent comment, one coherent response? Right. So notice, this guy calls himself your savior. But he's defending Islam. Then why Islam is fastest growing religion on earth? Why not Christians? Why not Christians? Um, do, do, do you actually want to know the answer to that? Because uh, we, we actually know the answer to that. The same Pew Research study that said that Islam is the world's fastest growing religion. We know why Islam is growing so rapidly. Do you know why it is? I know why it is because I actually read the study. Do you know why it is? It says right there in the study. It's not conversions. It's not people saying, oh, Islam is clearly the truth. The reason, even according to the Pew Research study that Muslims use to say, we've got the fastest growing religion. It says why it's the fastest growing religion. It says it's the fastest growing religion because of high Muslim birth rates. Muslims have higher birth rates than Christians. Muslims have way, way higher birth rates than atheists. Why do Muslims have higher birth rates than other places? Well, we actually know the answer to that too. You can study this. Muslims have the highest birth rates because in Muslim countries, girls get married off much earlier and start uh, having families much earlier That's than right. they do in non-Muslim countries. Why is that? Well, because Islam has such a negative impact on women and it treats them as nothing more than baby making machines throughout their life. <laughs> exactly, that yeah. In a Western country, a girl finishes school. Um, she might go on to college. She might go on to a career. She might do all of that before she even thinks about having a family, right? In Islam, the girls are married off at 13, 14, 15 years old. They start having babies. By the time a, a woman in America has her first child at 24, 25 years old, the Muslim girl, uh, the Muslim woman has four or five or six or seven kids, right? So because of Islam's impact on women, Women and girls are married off at a younger age. There's not much else for them to do in, in many other countries, and they start cranking out babies left and right. And so instead of having the, the one or two children that the average family would have in Western countries, they have six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 12, 15 kids. And it's the population of Islam explodes that way. And so if you really wanted to state your argument, my Muslim friend, if you really wanted to state your argument, it would go like this. Islam must be the truth because it has such a horrifyingly bad impact on women that it, it gives w women nothing to, nothing to do in life but to have tons of kids. And because they have tons of kids, then the population of Islam explodes. Therefore, Islam must be the truth because it has such a horrible impact on women. Now, if you want to make that argument, make it, but uh, hmm. don't don't just say it like this. Like <laughs> Muslims always act like it's because of the, the people are seeing the truth of Islam. Absolutely ridiculous, dude. Um, 
Oh, All boy. Right. Will they stop these arguments? Hopefully, by the grace of God, they stop these arguments, dude. I don't know. It's tiring. But, hey, All right. life. Actually, Sam, let's. Uh, uh, I wanted. I wanted to get. I see we've had some super chats and so on. So we'll watch this last clip by. And I mean, it's not the last clip. This last clip we're going to watch. We'll watch this last little bit by Adnan that we're going to watch. And if people want to see uh, more, we can cover. We can cover it uh, uh, at a future date. Uh, but right now, we'll we'll finish with. We'll see what he has to say about Surah two verse seventy nine. Then we'll look at the super chats and then we'll go ahead and close out. And we'll ask. We'll ask everyone what they think of the. Uh, of the earlier time and if they have a different time in mind because we had a you know we've had a, a you know around 1500 so that's uh that means there are a lot of people tuning in so if people want us to continue that we will but we'll actually we'll actually ask people if they have a different time like would two o'clock work better would noon work best what what uh, should we stick with four so we'll ask that in a minute um all right well let's go back to adnan here god almighty the author of the quran the one who revealed let me the back quran, up a little bit clearly put it uh, satisfactorily and the scholars could read what was written in the temples and they came to realize that the title Pharaoh was not used during the old kingdom for the kings. So this is an example as to how we know that the author of the Quran knew well what was in the text of the Bible and this is why he criticized the corruption of the Bible in chapter 2 verse 79. In chapters 2 in chapter 2, verse 79 of the Quran, God Almighty, the author of the Quran, the one who revealed the Quran, clearly describes how the Jewish people had corrupted their scripture. It categorically states, and I state, and I will quote, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Rajeem, Bismillah Rahman Rahim, Fawailul Lilladheena Yaktubun Al Kitaba Bi Aidihim, Thumma Yakuluna Hada Min Indillah, Li Yashtaru Bihi Thamanan Kalila. Woe be unto those who write books with their own hands. And then they say these books are, or they write the book actually. They write the book with their hands and they say this book is from God. Woe be unto what they write. Woe be unto what they earn. This refers clearly to the Israelite scribes who were writing the scripture and changing it as they went along. And they attributed these changes, these interpolations, these additions in the text to God Almighty, while the original Torah did not have these passages. So the Quran is very categorical about the scribes of the Israelites, how they had changed the scripture of Moses. Also, I want... All right, so it looks like he was going on to a different topic there. But guys, Sam, again, if when I see a Muslim in the chat saying something ridiculous and stupid, I can say, okay, you know, uh, guess what? Cr Christians can say things that are ridiculous and stupid. Atheists can say things that are ridiculous and stupid. Uh, people can people can say things and really believe them and, and not be trying to mislead. When someone like Adnan, who's read the Muslim sources, he know, Adnan knows, Adnan knows that throughout Surah 2, over and over again, like a beating drum, Allah says he's affirming the scriptures with the Jews. He knows that Muhammad pointed to a copy of the Torah and said, I believe in you and in the one who revealed you. He knows that long after the revelation of Surah 2 was Surah 5, where Allah once again affirms the inspiration and the preservation and the authority of the Torah. Um, Adnan knows all this. Adnan knows that even according to Muslim interpreters of the Quran, Surah 2 verse 79 supposedly refers to some, some Jews in 7th century Medina uh, trying to uh, trying to write a false description of the prophet to come to lead people away from the trail of Muhammad. Adnan knows that Jews in 7th century Arabia altering the text would not change the text of the Torah anywhere else in the world and that this would not influence the text of the Quran in any way. Adnan knows that Christians had copies of the Torah as well and that Jews changing something would not change Christian copies. Adnan knows that we have copies of the Torah from before the time of Muhammad, so unless he wants to say these Jews were time travelers, they had no ability to change, let's say, the Dead Sea Scrolls, Adnan knows all of this, and yet it's categorical. Categorically. It, 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 it talks about the corruption of the Christian scriptures. Categorically. And I just can't take someone seriously who, who, who talks yeah, like no, this. Yeah. And remember, he's supposedly one of the best Muslim debaters. <clears throat> One of the most knowledgeable Muslim debaters. Now, Muslims understand the implication. If this is your best, Adnan Rashid, Zakir Hussein, Zakir Naik, Shibri Ali, even though Shibri Ali is on a higher level than Adnan, when it comes to the use and abuse of liberal critical scholarship against Christianity, which he wouldn't use against the Quran consistently, though he does use it against Hadith, if this is your best, 
then Islam is going to sink faster than the Titanic by the grace of Jesus Christ, who's alive, who is risen, who's almighty. Time to abandon ship and get on the saving lifeboat of the cross of Calvary and turn to Jesus Christ, the true Christ, the Son of God, your Lord and Savior. Because Islam, its days are numbered, if this is your best. Yeah, um, yeah, you, you got a problem. You guys got a problem here. Yeah. Uh, but I, I just wanted to, uh, uh, we're going to... Uh, going to answer some uh, questions and comments from the super chat real quick. Other than that, we're going to be closing out here in a few, but uh, yeah, everyone just go ahead and watch my video. If you haven't watched it, um, once we close out here, go ahead and watch the video I posted earlier today on whether the whole, the whole video is on whether Surah 2 verse 79, which had none claims categorically claims that the scriptures, uh, that, that the scriptures of the Jews, the, the Torah has been corrupted. He says it, it categorically says this. Well, I give 26 reasons. There's no way it says this. Uh, and if you put all those together, the chances that the Quran there is saying that the Torah has been corrupted are zero, as, or as close to zero as you can possibly be in the realm of probability. There's no way Allah is saying that. The only way, the only way you could be claiming that Allah is saying that the Torah has been corrupted is if Allah is the absolute worst communicator in all of history, to such an extent that you can't believe anything he says, so who knows. Uh, to, and he's so... He's so horrible in his communication that he even misled his own prophet because Muhammad believed that Jews still had the reliable, inspired, preserved, authoritative Quran. I mean, Torah. So either way, the Quran is affirming the Quran, the Torah, the gospel, the Psalms. They're inspired, they're preserved, they're authoritative. Anyone who says otherwise is either ignorant or being deceptive. It's one or the other. But you can't, you can't, you can't get Adnan's interpretation out of the Quran without uh, being ignorant or deceptive. Um, all right, let's take some super chats here. Uh, Black Star Generation said, aren't you forgetting polygamy? So I think this is on the lines of uh, why uh, Islam uh, has the highest birth rates. Yes, polygamy definitely helps if you want high birth rates. So yes, that that uh, that is a factor. Uh, Satu Jam Saja uh, with the super sticker says, you are amazing. Thank you. Uh, ya El Elyon says, first time here. Keep up the good work. Wandrative. Uh, so Sam, Wandrative was the one who made the point about what Egyptian rulers were called before they were called Pharaoh. He says, uh, hey, I want to send you the information and also the link to the scholarly sources about the thing I wrote before. Where can I send this to? As far as me, you can go to my uh, YouTube channel page, and I think it's in the about section that'll have my email address there. Uh, what about you, Sam? You want this info? Yeah, I love it. If you want, send it to uh, <clears throat> SAM. S-H-M-N at yahoo.com. S-A-M-S-H-M-N at yahoo.com. Now, if you want us to publish it, I can publish it on my blog with your permission. That's up to you. That's because I have a blog. I'll be more than happy to post it to benefit others. But you let me know via email. Yep. Um, Colossians 117 says, please read John 13, 14 and Matthew 4, 7 and let Muslims interpret. Uh, Jesus bless all. Yeah, do we want to do that real quick? But yes. he said, let Muslims interpret. John chapter 13, verse 14, and Matthew 4, 7. You want to pull those up real quick? I'll yeah, read a yeah, couple more. I'll read a couple why more is he saying let uh, Muslims he, interpret? I, 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 that guy. I think he wants to, I think he wants to say, uh, Muslims, what's your interpretation? Go ahead and read the verses, and we'll, ask, we'll just okay. go ahead and ask him. Yeah, okay, because, yeah, because Matthew, I know what it's talking about. Yeah. Oh, so and then, John 13, yeah, 14, what, and Matthew 4, 7. Hmm. Yeah, that's where he baffled me. Okay, it says, I, uh, oh, okay. If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. Lord Jesus said unto him, it is written again, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. That's what I'm baffling. Is he asking to have the Muslims show how Jesus is claiming to be God here? No, I think I think he's saying uh, uh, Jesus is called Lord and Master, so Muslims yeah. tell us what he means here. Um, okay, I see, yeah. Yeah, yeah, because it will use his kudos, because the second one is that he's telling saying, don't tempt the Lord your God. So if, anyway, but I'll let him comment. I yep. won't put, but anyway, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, uh, zero one, real one uh, in the super chat. Uh, no comment, though. Uh, Dwayne Burke says, it states in the Hadiths that when the Mahdi comes, he discovers the gospel in Lake Tiberias in the yeah, Ark right. of the Covenant. That's a good one. I mean, I've I've won, I've gone through the D traditions, but I'm not an expert on it. It's been a while. Mm -hmm. Hey, if it's there, that's interesting. That's a good one because I'm not aware of any hadith. Now, if you if you have the reference, is it a Shia reference? Is it a Sunni work? Do they deem it to be daif or fabricated? That's also important. So yeah, I'm I'm, I'm actually uh, I'm not familiar with that one, but it would be interesting that the gospel is in 
that the gospel is in the Ark of the Covenant because I would assume that they still had the Ark of the Covenant during the time of Christians so that Christians yeah. could actually put a copy of the uh, gospel in the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, yeah, I, I think it's fabricated because if that was an authentic or multiply attested narration, we would have heard a lot more about that. But mm, I think it's yeah. one of those fabric because there's a lot of fabricated narrations about the Antichrist, about mm -hmm. the Mahdi, about Jesus. So yeah, yeah, but uh, yeah, send us a reference. We'll look it up and, and check the uh, check the rating. Um, Jojo Monster says all this after an entire alphabet of refutations. <laughs> yeah, smacking, but remember, to smacking credit, my weary head. But he's, he, with his credit, he did that before you came out with your video. But now what will his excuse be? Same, same thing it always is. Because, I mean, I, I didn't say anything unique in my video. I mean, all this information has been out there for years. And anyone who's familiar with the Muslim sources can know all of this. So it's just uh, he's going to do the same thing he always does, which is ignore all of the evidence and say what he needs to feel good about his religion, even if his religion is clearly and indisputably false. Um, Gary Pearson says, thanks, David and Sam. I thank God for you both. Uh, Rajan Marquez said, don't know how someone can believe in most obvious false religion from every angle. Yes, it's, Islam is, it's, it's, again, it's got to be spiritual darkness. If you're an atheist and you're looking at this, you have to you have to be thinking, no, the, the human mind could not possibly be this irrational. There has to be a spiritual dimension to the world, and yes. it'd be a good time to <laughs> to leave atheism yeah, exactly. based on the, It'd be funny if, if an atheist actually said, you know what, it's not the evidence for the existence of God, it's just there has to be a spiritual dimension if people are actually defending uh, defending Islam in this way. Hey, you know, on a side note, David, someone said something, not, not exactly along those lines, but there was an atheist that a Christian was talking to, and then when he saw your video and what you're going through and some of the things I'm going through and others, he goes, man, hearing their stories and their trials, it makes you start believing there is a spirit realm and there is a devil because how do you explain all these attacks on these men? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Even yeah, you even had an atheist saying that he was he was shocked and baffled. <laughs> yeah, guys, and uh, uh, just so you know, it is it is like it's like clockwork. It, it's it's like clockwork. Uh, the bigger the bigger whatever you're doing is, the more important it is. The the more of an impact it. it's going to have, the more havoc is rained down upon you. <laughs> hey, it's Ooh. it's to such an extent. It, this this happens so consistently that it, I'm talking years ago. All of a sudden, like everything would start going wrong, like horribly wrong, and I'd be like, "Cool, I know something awesome is about to happen. <laughs> I know, I know, I know some awesome, amazing work is about to happen right now because look, look at the look at the attacks that are that are coming." Um, all right, a couple more super chats. Uh, Gary Pearson says, "Thanks, David and Sam. This is gold dust information." Uh, Erhan and Quincy in uh, with the super stickers. L uh, birds. Lots of birds. <laughs> Dwayne Burke says, shout out to all Muslims who are hangry. <laughs> Hashtag Ramadan. Hangry. <laughs> That's funny. Sorry, folks. Uh, Magic Man says, God bless. Um, Hajorna Spark... Uh, uh, one of these uh, Scandinavian names. Hajorna Spark... Barkett says, uh, uh, hmm. Malik Melek, may our Lord richly bless, bless you both. Daniel Apologetic says, stream at this hour on behalf of Europe. Thanks. Actually, that, that's a good time, everyone. Uh, why don't you tell us in the chat? Um, because since we had uh, so many people show up, um, and I'm, I'm guessing that's that's because of that, that people who are in you know other parts of the world can watch at this time, tell us what time works best now we know that we're going to get some different answers right we'll try and take a take an overview of what of the times and and try to uh try to do try to do our best in other words we know some people are going to say no 7 a.m your time works best because you know that that's when it is that's when it's a good time in our part so uh so we know it, we're not going to make it work completely but we'll try to take into account what time works for uh the most uh the most people um cheryl r and hannah with the super stickers thank you king rich said uh, oh, I already read the uh, comment from King Rich with Mary as the sister of uh, Moses and Aaron. Uh, Sup people said, I heard that it... Oh, this is actually an interesting little side note. Uh, Sup people said, I heard that Islam allows bestiality. In some cases, can you make a video on this? Yeah. Now, Sam, this is basically, yeah, that's, a, this is basically that's an issue. Yeah, this is basically an issue where the Muslim sources are inconsistent. And you could take a hadith and say, look, this... this, this certainly sounds like it's allowing bestiality here but this other hadith condemns it and yeah is that sort of situation no it's more of a 
commentary, and again, I have an article on it. It's by the Muslim commentator of Sahih Muslim, Imam and Nawawi. He was giving regulations on <clears throat> ritual purification for specific sexual acts. So that's basically where it comes from. I have an article on it to show that for them to even be talking, let's say what happens if you do this or that and that, and even entertain the idea that let's say you defy yourself with an animal, even to talk about that, how stupid is that? I, I mean, th I thought there was a hadith in Sunan Abu Dawood mm -hmm. that said something about it. We'll have to we'll have to look into a little yeah, more yeah. of that. Yeah, yeah, but it, like, like, the the point with Nawawi, why would you even entertain that, even if it's simply theoretical? No Christian would come up with, let's say, a theoretical situation. Well, if a Christian sleeps with a dog, this is what you do, because that won't even enter our mind to even discuss such issue because it's yep. so disgusting, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's a, uh, it's a, uh, it's pretty, pretty bad. Um, the fact that they would talk about such stuff that tells you how sick these minds are. Yeah, it is pretty, uh, it is pretty, pretty gross and nasty. Hang on, let me see where I. I see. I thought I remembered something. Um, I thought it was a situation where there are conflicting narrations. Um, all right, we'll check those out for a future yeah. discussion. Uh, Aaron Larson says Adnan doesn't know his history. 19th century BC is not the old kingdom. So he's saying uh, Adnan is describing the different periods wrong. He's not even getting that right. Uh, yeah. I don't know. I don't know, Aaron. Uh, you you want to send us some stuff on uh, pointing out the, the problems? Uh, that'd be cool. But uh, not, not something I normally study. That's a surprise, David. He's trying to surprise you with all these erroneous dates. Surprise, David, to keep you sharp. See how it works? All right. Mm -hmm. Um. Alex Antal says, Hi, David and Sam, a question for both. Which Bible translation you read and why that one? How you get yeah. to remember verses? What are your techniques? Thank you. So a couple, a couple of questions there. Uh, which Bible translation to use and uh, how do you remember verses? Yeah. I think Sam remembers verses just because he has a computer-like brain. So that's probably not going to be of most use to most people, including me. Uh, Bible translation, I, I, I read different translations. I'll usually stick to a translation for a year or two and then switch translations. Um, and you know, you know, spend use the a different translation for the next year or two. So most recently, yeah. I've, I've been using the the ESV, which I like. But uh, I've used in the past a uh, King James version, New King James version, uh, uh, New Revised Standard, um, New American Standard, and NIV. So I think I've yeah. yeah, those are the ones I basically used over the years. Yeah. Now, my, my advice would be whatever Bible translation helps you get to know Jesus and fall in love with him and worship him and live for him, stick with that. I don't make it an issue. I have my own personal preferences, but <clears throat> I don't want language to be a stumbling block to anyone who <clears throat> wants to come to know Jesus. In other words, you may not speak English that well, and if you pick up a King James, you may get lost, but if you read NIV, it helps you. As long as it helps you fall in love with the true Jesus and get to <clears throat> trust in him and walk with him, stick with that. You know, I don't make that an issue personally. I have my own personal preference. I go with the majority text, but that's a different issue, and I don't make that an issue at all. Mm -hmm. So whatever makes you fall in love with Jesus, that's the key. Whatever – let me repeat. I want to sound like a broken record. Whatever version that makes you fall in love with the real Jesus, the real God – and trust in him and walk with him and know he's real, stick with it. Mm -hmm. um, oh, uh, Sam, I actually found what I was thinking of here. Yes, what was so it? So this is Sunan Abu Dawud 4465. Yes. Asim reported from Abu Razin on the authority of Ibn Abbas saying, there is no prescribed punishment for one yeah. who has sexual intercourse with an animal. Yeah, Abu yeah that, said, I'm aware of that, yeah. yeah. But I, I I, was assuming he's talking about the justification, meaning it's allowed for you to sleep with an animal. Yeah, I was just thinking of, I, I think someone's saying, well, if there's no prescribed pun punishment, then, yeah. then I could do it. But but, but again, uh, th these are... There are conflicting narrations. So you have you have uh, you have other you have other narrations which say that that the penalty is death. You have this which says you can treat him like a uh, hmm. even in this idea says you can treat him like a like a fornicator, but not to the same extent that you would treat him as fornicating yeah. with a with a human being. And so it's basically the sources are 
a mess. And so I think the criticism here would be, yeah, if you, if you go into the issues that, that, that Sam was talking about, uh, it's just weird that there, that this is even yeah. an issue here. Um, but also yeah. it's, it's a situation <laughs> where, why, why is there even any conflict on these sources? Yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, right, yeah. Yeah. And then it's like, I mean, Dave, would you ever imagine writing an exposition about what happens if a Christian does this and then say, and if you sleep with a cow, this is what you need to do. <laughs> I mean, honestly, Oh, <laughs> yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, um, yeah. That's Islam for you. All right. A couple more super chats uh, here. Solitary Emmy uh, with the uh, with the fox in the uh, super sticker. The polemicist said, um, Sam, you oh, here you go. Sam, you called Shabir Ali a snake glass house. So you're a snake, too, Sam. All right. Thank you. There, Appreciate yeah. it. Snake. So now you've got another name. Snake Shamoon. OK, that's fine. I'm going to lose sleep because you called me a snake. <laughs> But yeah, okay. uh, Forrest Wood said, don't forget Russia. So I guess, I guess he's uh, talking about in the timing. Sophia Film said, next challenge, show us original Quran Muslims. Actually, I've seen that suggested a couple times for uh, for another challenge. I think the next challenge I'm going to do, because because uh, um, I've been putting these challenges that are based on Muslim ideals, everyone. So, so Muslims will say, ah, give me one unequivocal statement that says this. And so, great, I'm just using their method against them. So the next thing I think I'm going to do is, um, uh, a question, uh, another question no Muslim can answer, and I think it'll probably be, so this is a heads up to the Muslims, get ready. Show me one unequivocal verse from the Bible that refers to Muhammad as a prophet. And then, but that's another one. Uh, show me another question Muslims can't, can't answer. Uh, show us the original Quran. Um, George Wagner says, uh, says, uh, <laughs> God says you can't defy logic. Allah replies, uh, I can't see it. Sure. All right. So, uh, any other thoughts? By the way, did uh, um, I guess I can I can look through I can look through the chat later to check times as far as what works. And now uh, most of them were saying this is good time. Some said four o'clock. So this is the time reach three and four. And most of them said yeah, excellent time, because in Europe, UK, it's like around ten between nine and ten o'clock. So people are still up. And two hours that means midnight. Yes. Yeah, so they go between three and four. I was looking at it. All right, and guys, uh, just side note: is is it is this a good day? Is Saturday a good day to do that? Um, if so, then if so, oh, people are giving times, but in different time zones, so you'll have to check that out. All right, guys, uh, Sam, any final thoughts for yeah. everyone here? No, uh, one I was going to say that the second part it is important to address because he brings up variant readings in the New Testament, like the longer ending of Mark and the uh, pericope adultere and first john 5 7 all of which he uses to show see the quran already hinted at these corruptions and modern textual criticism shows muhammad was right how did he know if the quran is not from allah and muhammad confirmed the gospel why would he hint at these corruptions i think that then, part we need to address by the grace of jesus okay um yeah maybe uh Maybe just because uh, Texas Adnan makes so many mistakes in his videos that it takes us hours to uh, yeah. to go through them, especially if we're, tr we're actually trying to interact with comments and so on. So, uh, Sam, uh, any because uh, Adnan's going to actually be uh, posting more videos and so on. But yeah. anytime you say, "Hey, I want to respond," uh, you know, th the point he makes right here at minute nine between yeah. nine and and ten thirty and stuff like that. Uh, mm -hmm. Just, just, just. Just, just tell me the time, and I'll, I'll download it. I'll cut that part out, and we can respond it. And that might actually help us get through his stuff more quickly if we actually yeah. focus on his main points. Yeah, the reason why I, we need to, because I don't want the Muslim followers of Nano nonsense. See, they didn't address that part of my rebuttal because they yeah. couldn't. It was mm -hmm. overwhelming. We don't want to give them an excuse not to come to Jesus and believe the gospel. Yeah, and, and it's hilarious because when we're doing our live streams and we go through the entire video, I say the reason we have to go through this entire video is because if I leave one second out, they'll say, aha, that was the second that exactly. completely refuted you. But then, so we, we, we'd make the entire live stream going through everything. But then in a, in, a, in a later separate video where I'm trying to make a short video, I say, okay, he said this and here's the refutation. And as soon as I do that, the comments in the, aha, why'd you leave out the rest of the video that completely refutes you? And I'm like, dude, we did a three hour live stream going through everything. Notice what they say, right? No, notice the position, right? You cannot focus on one particular point and answer it. You can't do that. 
So notice, the only way I would ever be able to respond to a Muslim video is if I respond to everything and make it three hours long. I can never address a, a, a simple point. And guys, once again, how can you call yourselves the people of truth and, and when, when, you, when your methods are like this? No one would ever say you can't take a, a clip of Sam Shamoon and respond to the point he's making. No Muslim would ever say that. You guys say it in response. What is this religion? All right, Sam. Let me just quote one verse because someone told to Andrew Martin. Mm -hmm that uh, there is no bow god in the quran chapter 37 verse 125 and andrew martin knows his quran and hopefully he'll come back to jesus christ sooner than later because yes he says yes there is chapter 37 verse 125 will ye cry unto baal baal and forsake the best of creators the reason why baal is mentioned in this particular context it's narrating the story of elijah and that's another challenge for adnan adnan here's another challenge why does the Quran call Elijah Elias and Eliasin, as if his name can be pluralized to Eliasin? Why is he called Elias Eliasin? Number one, Eliasin doesn't even correspond to the Greek form of Elijah. And number two, Elias may conform to the Greek form of Elijah. But why is the Quran butchering the Greek form of Elijah's name and not getting the Arabic cognate of Elijah <clears throat> right in the Quran? Things to make you go, hmm. Surprise, David. I got surprised. There. You surprised you surprised me again. All right, everyone. Well, we will continue in light of our tremendous patience that we've been blessed with. We will continue going through Muslim videos, Muslim articles, hoping that the Muslims in the chat who have so much trouble seeing any seeing anything about their own religion or anything about our religion seeing anything clearly because of the impact their religion has had on their thinking ability will hope that by seeing their points and their positions refuted over and over and over again easily like a beating drum we hope that seeing their apologists that they respect and think are telling them the truth exposed as liars over and over and over again we hope that some some kind of light will eventually break through that cloud of darkness that their religion has enveloped them in uh, and that they can actually see. And once once they see that, then they are on their way out of Islam. All right. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. And since, uh, since we had so many people, we will, uh, Lord willing, we will return with more. Christ for, is risen. For more early, early live streams. Catch you all later. Risen indeed. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus.